Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Kit and Krista podcast, episode 36. We're more than halfway done with Shocktober. Wow. Whoa, it's been shocking. It for has. Sure. Um, we have a very special guest on this week's episode, the one and only Jeff Keeley, mm. industry icon. Um, Jeff is uh, was kind enough to come onto the show and hang out with us for a bit and talk all about the Game Awards, which is coming up very quickly. And we, of course, have to share some behind-the-scenes stories of when we all worked on the Game Awards together. And uh, yeah, this is this has gone way back to 2014. You were there. As with all these things, well, we were both there. We um, were both there. The That's first, true. the first Game Awards in 2014, a big performance by Koji Kondo with, uh, believe it or not, Imagine Dragons. Yes. And uh, that is quite the story to tell. So Jeff uh, is going to hang around and tell us a little bit about that from his perspective. Yeah, so fun to hear it from. Jeff's perspective and it's fun to do a Nintendo story time this way where we have like another person come on and, and, and t- tell a story that we were all a part of um, when we worked together at Nintendo. So this is kind of something cool. we might be trying out with with more and more guests in the future because a lot of these people yeah. have worked with Nintendo so it is fun especially for things where we were both sides were involved. It's <laughs> exactly. like let's piece this story see? together. The puzzle is very intricate yes. and sometimes stress-inducing. For Could you this. tell this was all hanging on by a thread? <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> Hopefully not, because it really was. The thinnest <laughs> of ice is what we were on, right? Um, but it's so great. I'm so glad that we're getting more guests on the show. And it was really important, again, really important for us to have Reggie first and Jeff second. So this is what we're doing, and we're excited about it. Who's number um, three? Who knows? Who knows? Surprises will be coming along the way. But uh, of course, um, as with every single episode of everything that you see on the Kit and Krista channel, all of this is made possible by our wonderful Patreon family. And we definitely can't do this without you. So thank you so much for supporting us. We have um, just a growing community that is really special to us. And if you'd like to join that community, we are at patreon.com slash Kit and Krista. Tons of tears. Lots of options, and we'd love to have you be be a part of it. We bow down to our Patreon overlords. True. Um, <laughs> get in <laughs> for as true. little as $2 a month, and who knows? Maybe one day you can grow into one of our superstars who have a yeah. hand in helping us to make all this stuff. Exactly, exactly. They're super involved. Superstars, super involved in helping us make the show, and we appreciate them so much. Um, but everybody that contributes to our Patreon has a hand in making this all possible. And we want to keep doing this for you guys. We love to do this, but we can only do it if you support us there. Um, all right. We we are, again, this October, man. It it's is, called that for a reason. It's called that for a reason because we've really, we've really got a big week this week. And, and actually started already this morning. We were um, really excited and grateful to Ubisoft for sending us some codes for um, Mario plus Rabbids. Um, again, I, I, I sent a message out today. I am auditioning. I'm, I'm on the bachelorette for a uh, rabbit husband playing this game. All auditions will be will be judged by me on who will who I will marry out of the rabbits family. But um, we have some really fun gameplay that we did for. The unreleased Mario Plus Rabbits available now on our channel. I did Please see check it out. Ubisoft was doing something fun where they seem to be taking people and making them into rabbits. And I really <gasps> want them to do that to you to just turn oh, the yeah. tables, turn the tables on you. I would love to be then a I can rabbit. Point, then I can point and laugh at you. <laughs> I would love that. You I would freak. love that. Give me the ears and the, the weird eyes. I just... Sure. Oh Give me the treatment. I, I would love that. Yes. But we're going to be um, talking more about that game in the games we're playing yes. segment. But spoiler, we like it. We do like it. And if you want us to see, if you want to see us play the first hour of Mario Plus Rabbids, it is available right now on our um, on our channel, Kit and Krista Play. Um, super fun. And we'll talk about it in a little bit. More games have been played and made. Indeed. Uh, which is um, our last Super Kitten Krista 64, we did Mario Maker 2 levels inspired by the Mario movie trailer. Big idea by you. Tell us all about it. 
Well, this was great. We both made levels and we got three levels from our Patreon superstars, um, all of which I think it was so fun to see the different renditions of what we saw in the trailer in the totally. game form. It was a ton of fun to go back to Super Mario Maker. I hope people are enjoying playing those courses. Those codes yep. are in the video. Yes. But um, I, I continue to be hyped for this movie. And it was great to play those levels. Yeah. As I said, this is really the beginning of Mario the movie, the game. Um, giving it away to Nintendo once again. These great ideas. But you know what? It's okay. If it's all for the benefit of making the Mario movie like a billion dollar maker, then then let's, let's all... Band together as Mario fans to do it, right? Um, but it was so much fun to like interpret the trailer into a level that could be in a Mario game. And yeah, we um, if you have levels for us, we'd love to play them. So drop them in the comments yes, um, of that please. video, please. All right, continuing on to a not so wholesome Super Kitten Crystal 64. This one, you really had to twist my arm and I was not super excited. And well, hold on now. This was your idea. No, it wasn't. You said we should, since we're getting close <laughs> to Halloween at the end of Shocktober, we should play a scary game. So that's what we're doing. Well, okay. Let me preface this. First of all, I'm wearing my boo sweatshirt. Very thematic. Okay. For, I'm terrified. Um, but I said we can play a game. And my thinking was we would play in broad daylight. We would play this game together. Like there, it would be like a very like shared experience where I would have like moral support if something super scary happens. But that is not what. Well, that's you... not very fun. So we're doing it. We're doing it my way. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Um, like you twisted my arm into doing this, and I'm not sure how I'm gonna be tomorrow when we film this so, video. Or... Some of the details. Yeah. Um we put out a poll asking people what game they wanted us to play. Sneaky Us, we put out the poll two different places on Twitter right. and YouTube. The same poll, but we got two different results. Uh, the winner. So we're choosing the one that we want. We're choosing to do. the one that we would prefer to one do. Is, one's, one is scared in the yeah. other, and I was too scared to do On that. Twitter, Outlast was the winner, which a lot of people say is great, but I think is, is legitimately too scary for us. <laughs> uh, so we're not going to play that. We're going to play the winner of the YouTube poll, which was Until Dawn. Yes. which um, is sort of a, a, you know, a modern classic. Um, I've always been curious about, so I'm excited to play that. Um, but we have also modified our schedule. So we are recording this at night, in the dark of night, under the cloak no! of night. Um, that's so scary. That's, that's good. I'm already scared. Already scared. We're going further now. Um, the great um, Etika once did a stream where he was hooked up to a heart monitor during like a Nintendo direct, I which I thought that. was like a genius idea. Um, and it's like, gosh, you know, we, we both have Apple watches. Those can tell yeah. you your heart rate. So yeah, exactly. We are going to be BPMs right now. keeping a close oh. eye on the heart rate. And if, if things aren't scary enough for you, they're going to get a little bit more scary. Right. So if your heart rate is low, then there's going to be, Thing modifiers. You got to do some some more. stuff to make it scarier. Exactly. Right. Some some things are like turning off all the lights, or one person leaves the room, or the person that's less scared has to play. Right. Um, all sorts of things that are meant to just horrify and maybe make me sick. So we'll see how that how that goes. I I have confidence though that my heart rate will be so high throughout the whole mm. thing that I won't have to do any of these things. Okay. And and I have I feel like yours is going to be lower, and so you'll just have to do all the scary things, and then I, I'll, I'll get to leave the room and I'll have to deal with it. So that that is actually one uh, thing that I'm pretty like feeling okay about. This is the, this is the only way I'm why I'm doing this because I feel like that is going to happen. So listen, we shall see. If you end up leaving that room, don't you dare come back in. Just hit the road and I go home. I don't want to. I'll take I, it from I, there. Thanks a lot. Great. I, I, I <laughs> that's what I was waiting for you. Your to Your services tell me. are I'm, no longer needed. I got perfect. this. I don't want to be part of the service anyway. So it's exactly what I want. And so that's great. Anyways, um, we had kind of an argument about this video, like leading up to it, because I got really freaked out. And then you're in, in the moment of like anger, you're like, well, do you want to do this or not? And I was like, no, I don't. Again, this was your idea. Um, <laughs> no, you're having, having a meltdown before we've even done it. I love it. Uh, that video will be out uh, a few days from now. Perfect for <laughs> Halloween. Perfect. Um, the last little bit of news uh, up front is yeah. very, very exciting. 
It is exciting. Which is uh, in a couple days at the end of the week, we are catching a plane to New York. The Big Apple. Which we have not been to in, uh, boy, I got to think back. I mean, three, at least three, three years. Three plus years. Yeah. Uh, we have been invited to be guests on the Nintendo podcast, which is incredible. Drama. No, just kidding. No, no drama. <laughs> You're gonna ambush these guys or what? Spill the tea. Spill the tea. No, just kidding. I'm, I'm totally kidding. I, we're very excited. We've been we've been talking about this with um, the guys over there for quite some time, trying to get it, uh, schedules to sync and all that stuff. I'm so excited to be there in person with them in New York. We're gonna just chat it up. It's gonna be fun. Um, and yeah, we're we're also gonna vlog. Um, while we're in New York, which is going to be another episode of Super Kitten Krista 64. So you can look forward to a fun New York vlog. Um, we're definitely going to visit the store and, and do some other fun things there. Um, so yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a great trip. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to um, to seeing the guys. Yeah. If you don't listen to Nintendo, check them out. They do a great yes. show every week. Um, and Wooden Bob have their own channels, which are really cool. But um, yes, our universe is expanding and I'm looking forward to it. Exactly. Yeah, we got guests on. We got we're guests on other people's shows. This is what is all about this like awesome, you know, like ability for us to do all of these things now that we're we're on our own. That's right. It's great. It's great. Well, I guess we should we ha- this is gonna be a pretty long podcast. That, episode, yeah, we I should think. say this might be a longer episode. It's gonna be a long one. So just settle on in. Um if you haven't gotten your like tea or coffee or whatever. Go get it now. And we're going to um, jump to our amazing story time with the one and only Jeff Keeley about the very first Game Awards and, and talk about Jeff and Game Awards in general right now. Well, here we are with our second very special guest, your friend and ours, Jeff Keeley. Thank you for being on the show today. Wonderful. We're so excited to have you. I, I'm Honored to be on here, honored to be your second guest, and so proud of you guys. I remember talking to you just when you were leaving, uh, yeah. geez, I guess it was earlier this year, and it was uh, amazing to see what you guys have built, and uh, I'm a proud subscriber and excited to, uh, honored to be on, really. Yeah, yeah, you you and Reggie were definitely two of the strongest supporters of us starting this whole thing, and for people who don't know, you know, we worked very closely with Jeff on Game Awards in recent years, but... I think I first started working with you when I was at Konami like 15 years ago or like a long time ago. Yep. Yeah. I've been doing it a long time. That's right. I mean, back, uh, (laughs) yeah, Konami. I mean, I was doing like, when I was in college, I did the final hours of Metal Gear Solid 2. um, And yeah, worked a lot when, you know, you were at Konami and Mark was at Konami and stuff like that. So yeah, I've been, I've been around. I think I've been doing game stuff now for 30 years, which is is crazy. I mean, I started when I was very young. But uh, yeah, it's been a lot of years. It, it is amazing to look back at some of your really early work. Like you were, you were quite young when you got started. How, how did you get into this? Well, it, it's a long story, but I can give you the short version of it. I mean, basically, I was a big fan of video games growing up. Uh, my brother and I would play a lot of games, played a lot of PC games. And we had Nintendo as well um, and Sega Genesis. I was kind of in the NES uh, Sega Genesis era when I was sort of first a kid. Yeah, but I had PC games, and I really loved a lot of the old adventure games from Sierra Online and LucasArts. So one day I wrote a letter to Sierra Online, put it in the mail. I grew up in Canada, mailed it down to Oakhurst, California, and said, I love your games. I'd love to know more about how you make them. And I never thought I'd get a response. But a few days later, uh, I got a letter back from a lady named Gano Hain saying, Jeff, thank you for your letter. Uh, we're glad that you're such a big fan. Would you like to be a volunteer beta tester for our upcoming games? Um, so I got really excited and they started sending me early versions of their adventure games that I got to play through, um, as a volunteer. So I was doing that in between, you know, math and and science homework in high school. Uh, but (laughs) sort of what came out of that was then when the games came out, I was on CompuServe, which was an early, uh, sort of pre-internet service. And there was a forum called the gamers forum. And when the games came out, I was this person on the forum who seemed to know everything about every Sierra adventure game because I had played through them and I knew the hints and tips about how to get through them. So I'd often reply to people giving them advice on sort of what to do when you got stuck in an adventure game. Uh, And then one day an editor from a magazine called Strategy Plus, a guy named Steve Bauman, um, noticed my post and said, wow, this this person really seems to know a lot about games, seems to be very uh, articulate about them, maybe uh, he would be a great person to preview games for our magazine. So he sent me an email. So would you like to preview games for the magazine? 
And I got this email and I freaked out because I was 13 years old at the time. And uh, he had no idea <laughs> though, because he was just reading my posts on this forum. And it was a great early example of the the anonymity of the internet actually being a positive thing um, back then that he just judged me purely based on the words on the screen, not based on my age or, or who I was. Uh, and yeah, I got hired to do my first preview of uh, Will Wright's Sim Farm back in, I think it was 1993 uh, when I did my first article. Wow. That's incredible. That And it's one of those lessons that like people should just go for it. You know what I mean? Like you would yeah. never have really... I think like dipped into the industry that early if you didn't just like on a whim, you know, write that letter. So people should go for it. And that's, that's a really cool like lesson in that. Yep. No, that's what I always say to people. Exactly. Krista is that whenever, even now I cold email people pretty often and just sort of, you know, guess someone's email address and send a note. <laughs> uh, and it's like, I still do that to this day. And you're right. You just sort of have to go and get it and, and, you know, be prepared for the rejection of never hearing back or anything like that. And look, they're, I try and respond to as many emails as I get because I always think, you know, who is that that young kid out there who wants to get their start? Um, but you're right. I would just, you know, go after it. Of course, I, you know, it's a different time in the gaming industry, uh, you know, 30 years ago where it was a little bit um, a little bit less intense. And, and I don't know if that trick would work today if someone wants to work <laughs> at Nintendo, just email Doug Bowser. But um, it's, uh, yeah, it's it's it was amazing. And I was so, so honored that I got to, find my calling when I was that young, because uh, to this day, uh, you know, I've never had another job, right? I've never had to go work at uh, a restaurant or a bar or retail, because I was, uh, I started playing games and covering games when I was a little kid. And I've just done that for the rest of my life. Oh, that's amazing. There's a question I've been wanting to ask you. And obviously, now you're you're best known for the game awards. But I yep. don't know if people really realize how omnipresent you are in the games industry. You seem to know everybody, be involved in so many different projects. What would you say your role is now in the games industry? Well, it's definitely evolved, right? Uh, because I started pretty much as a journalist. And that's what you know. You guys first met me as I was kind of you know writing reviews for Entertainment Weekly magazine or, or covering games. So I kind of started as a, a, a print journalist, really. Uh, and then transition into doing a lot of television hosting for the late, again, G4 and uh, also Spike TV. I did a show there called Game Head or Game Trailers TV for many years. Uh, and then probably by 2014 or 15, I started the Game Awards and I tra transitioned to being much more of a producer. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I, I don't review games anymore. I actually try and be somewhat impartial and not kind of uh, reviewing games because of my position. I have to be very careful with the game awards because because I'm sort of the, the face and brand of it, people automatically assume that, you know, Jeff picks the winners or he's deciding. Um, the Keeleys. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, it's, 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 it's a good and a bad thing because I see even today, I posted that I was, uh, you know, uh, getting to play God of War and everyone's like, oh, the game awards is rigged. He's got an early copy, so he's going <laughs> to yeah. give the award to them. And it has, you know, nothing to do with that, but it's it's a it's a common thread. So, yeah, my, my job now I would describe very much as a, as a producer um, who kind of pulls all these things together, works with everyone in the industry, and I've, I've kind of moved away from being a, a traditional journalist. I, I really miss that. And once in a while, I'll go back and write a story. I did a piece a couple of years ago on the making of Half-Life Alex with Valve, <laughs> Final hours of Half Life, Alex, which is kind of like a, a making of um, a special guest, Krista. Always, always the zoo <laughs> over here. Sorry, keep going, keep That's going. Good. I, I love it. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I've really kind of moved more in the production behind the scenes um, role, but I still, you know, I'm obviously very involved in the industry, as you said. And one of the reasons I'm able to do what I do today is because of that history of kind of working with, you know, you guys or working with Reggie or working with, you know, any of these game companies because I've known them for 20 or 30 years. So that's part of the reason I think hopefully people trust me um, to deliver a good show. So we were looking back at the game awards and sort of the history of the show uh -huh. because we've got a fun story to, to talk about a little bit later on, but it started, yeah. the first show was in 2014. And yep. before then, you know, you talked about doing the Spike TV video game awards there was VGX, which we might need to have you back another time to talk about that one. Talk about um, Cranky Kong, the Cranky Kong. The Cranky Kong. Scandal. The oh, my scandal. gosh. Scandal. Yes. The drama. Talk about There's drama. a lot of drama that year. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Going from, you know, a show that was a part of Spike, like what was like the risk level of starting this up, of going from that 
sort of a safety net to something that was really all you. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I've, I've been doing game award shows for a long time. I started in 1994 when I was a little kid. I, I helped write a show called Cybermania 94, which was the first video game award show hosted by Leslie Nielsen, the late, great Leslie Nielsen and Jonathan Taylor Thomas from Home Improvement. You can still find it on, uh, on YouTube. Uh, but I worked on that as a kid. And then, yeah, as you said, worked on on Spike's award show for many years. And then also G4 had a show called G4ia. So I've been around them for, for many, many years. And, and most people knew me at the time for, you know, working on the Spike VGAs. I spent almost a decade working on that show. Uh, and then, yeah, we did the VGX show in 2013 with Joel McHale and I hosting. That's the one where Reggie uh, showed up and we had a, a lot of drama around. That Absolute people. classic. <laughs> <laughs> yes, her cranky Kong had, I think, leaked out of Europe or something like that, and Reggie was going to reveal him. Um, but anyways, we, we got through that one. And yeah, I, in 2014, I realized that YouTube and Twitch were continuing to grow as a platform for live streaming. I had I learned a lot working on the Spike show, but it was very much a traditional television show. And with that came a lot of the challenges of making you know a big budget television production, um, trying to appeal to this sort of mass audience. And I said, well, maybe uh, there's an opportunity to do something just directly for the gaming audience and use YouTube and Twitch as a live stream platform. So, yeah, in 2014, I kind of bet on myself and said, let me build something new. And I went around to all the game companies, uh, including Nintendo and PlayStation and Xbox, and asked them to support me in building something, you know, kind of a new award show. And that was really the birth of the Game Awards in 2014. I look back and I don't know how I had the courage and gall to just sort of say I was going to go off and do this. Um, but I think it was a combination of being frustrated with where the sort of spike show had had, had, had evolved into um, and this belief that there was sort of a another another opportunity now to not have to work through a television network. And look, it's back in the day when I was hosting TV shows, I have to remember a good, you know, 10, 15 years ago, people were amazed that you could see, you know, full scale resolution video footage of games on television and like the internet couldn't even provide that. So you're like, Oh, let me tune in to spike because I can watch HD footage of a video game. Um, and that was, you know, just so ahead of its time. Whereas now, obviously, I mean, we broadcast the game awards in 4k on YouTube. It's, it's higher quality than even you get on television. So yeah, it was just a combination of sort of the, the, the situation that we were in with the VGAs and this new opportunity of the internet and live streaming that just sort of came together, the confluence of all those things allowed me to go off and, and build this new thing in, uh, in 2014. And I still remember going to Nintendo back then and, and talking to Reggie when I think he was on a, he was on a scuba trip in, in Hawaii. And I remember calling him and pitching him the idea of the game awards and things like that. And he had, he had a lot of tough questions for me, but uh, yeah, he, he joined the advisory board and, and we, we made it happen. And it was a really great time because I was, you know, I was working with Nintendo as well on some of the directs and doing a lot of other things um, as well at that time. So it was a, yeah, it was a special couple of years um, to get to work on, um, you know, work on the, the the birth of the Game Awards. And then obviously, you know, the next year was when Mr. Wada passed away. So there was a lot going on inside of um, Nintendo at that point. But I, I'm forever grateful that I got to got to start it when I did. Yeah, I think my favorite thing about the Game Awards is that it gives sort of this like moment for the industry to kind of come together at the end of the year and really celebrate like all the cool things that have happened. Um, I think that is that sort of feeling is always very strong whenever we attend the Game Awards. Do you think that's one of the elements or what are the, some of the other elements you think yeah. about the TGAs that make this sort of a thriving show while other award shows are like really struggling? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. It's something we think about a lot. I do agree for us in the industry. It's just exciting to think that we're coming together. Like I get excited now thinking about you know, the orchestra this year playing the Elden Ring, Ring theme and hopefully, you know, Miyazaki is going to be sitting there in the front row, you know, um, grooving along. Like that's just the, the amazing to me. Like I remember the year that Breath of the Wild was there and to have an orchestra play the Breath of the Wild theme for, you know, Mr. Anuma, and Mr. Fujiyashi, like as they were sitting there. I mean, that's just an experience, like even though they've spent years of their life working on this game, they never got to experience that to just sort of hear their music played live. So those kind of moments, I think, just are galvanizing and bring us all together as an industry and get excited, right, to see each other. And especially given the past few years of the pandemic, I think it's even more important, right? And everyone just loves the idea of sort of seeing each other, um, just celebrating how exciting this industry is because so many things are 
so virtual in this industry have always been, but even more so now. So yeah, I think it is that sense of community that we feel in the room, but I also feel the audience at home and fans really just want to gather and celebrate their passion and hobby in a really big way. Um, so it is something that matters to people. And that really means a lot to me. So I do think that that sense of community is a driving force. And then certainly the, you know, the reveals and the news and the announcements um, are another thing that kind of differentiate this show from other award shows. And look, some people will, will always say, you know, it should just be an award show. It shouldn't have announcements and there'll, there'll be that sort of healthy tension. But it really does drive a lot of the awareness and excitement to wonder, you know, what's going to be revealed or when we, you know, a few years ago, we tweeted the smash envelope, right? Saying, hey, someone new is joining, you know, smash tonight. I mean, that just gets the fans really excited. It, it creates insane expectations every year of, of people wanting us to have all these amazing announcements for them and, and we don't make the game. So it's always, uh, uh, that's the most stressful part for me is just kind of wondering what are we going to be able to share with the audiences at home. Um, but yeah, so I think it's a combination of that, that sense of community. It's the, the news and the announcements and, and the awards too. I think people really do love to wonder, you know, what's going to win game of the year. And that's something that is a, is a big debate every year. Uh, and this year too, I think we'll, we'll see. I mean, Elden Ring certainly has a lot of momentum behind it, but we'll see uh, what else is going to sort of come up here in the next uh, couple of weeks that, that may challenge it. Um, but yeah, overall, uh, I, it's, it's, it's a unique thing. And I think, you know, as E3 sort of started to die out and all these other things kind of went away, um, Game Awards, I think takes a, is a really, is an interesting position now, right? Cause I think it's an award show, but it also is this really big news moment for the industry as well. You know, some people refer to it as kind of the winter E3. Um, and I get why that's important to the industry that we have this platform to kind of make news and announcements. So yeah, it's, it's a, it's a huge obligation we feel now. Um, it's hard to believe that um, next year will be our 10th show. So we've been doing it for, for a long time. I was honestly shocked going back, realizing that the show started in 2014. I thought, oh, Game Wars, those started, you know, five yeah. or so years ago. Obviously not. Um, yeah. Was that, like, did you get people who scoffed at you when you said, I'm doing an online only show, there's no TV component? Because I think that's really been a hallmark of the show is like, you always seem to be ahead of the curve in a lot of ways, yeah. you know, whether it's yeah. trying out like different social platforms or tools or... Yeah saying, hey, I'm going to broadcast this around the world. It's, it's, it feels like you're a few steps ahead. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it's, it's sort of driven out of necessity, I think, because, uh, yeah, we started with just, you know, YouTube, Twitch, uh, Twitter, and Steam, I think, or something like that. And yeah, every year, to your point, we've tried to add new platforms and break new ground. Because my view is that, especially now with publishers being able to do so much directly with Nintendo Direct or State of Play or other events, you know, our obligation is to really continue to grow our show to do new things that other people aren't. So they see the value in what we're building. And one thing that like we're talking about, Krista, how you have to sort of always, you know, kind of be proactive and go out there and, 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 and try new things, whether it's reaching out to Sierra with an email or, or a letter or um, finding new places to distribute the show. I realize every year we have to do better um, and we can't just sort of rest on our laurels. So yeah, I've been very aggressive in thinking of new ways to do things, as you said, um, a lot of our growth in, in China and India has, has been amazing. Um, this year, we're adding an IMAX theaters where fans will get to actually go to IMAX theaters around the world to kind of watch the show live as a community. So, yeah, we, um, we've we really been thinking about, you know, new ways to do things. And, and yes, to your point, Kit, back when we started in 2014, a lot of companies uh, didn't believe it was possible. And they said, well, why wouldn't you be on television? This needs to be a cable show. How is this going to work on the Internet? Um, and some people believed in what we were doing, but a lot of people were very skeptical that we were going to be able to kind of reach a wide audience that way. And one of the appeals of the Spike show was this sense that you were reaching this kind of mythical mainstream viewer that was watching television. And that was, you know, what, something that a game company couldn't get, right? They could put up some screenshots or video on the internet, but they couldn't get on cable television. Um, now, I mean, we have absolutely no interest in ever being on cable television again, because, you know, we're, we're it's just really global. And that's the thing that I think has been the most um, heartening aspect of the Game Awards is that I used to live in very much a U.S. TV bubble where you were judged based on your Nielsen ratings, which is an antiquated way of looking at things. And now um, when I travel the world and I see how the Game Awards is respected around the world and in, in Asia and in India and in Europe, uh, it's really meaningful to me. So the fact that we have a truly global show has been, um, as I said, really heartening. It's, it's cool. And I think even around the world, it's 
in some ways respected even more than it here here is in the states in terms of what it really means to people and uh, and and especially in in Asia I found it's really this great reverence for the show which which means a lot to me so yeah it's it's one of those things that like we said you have to just take the risk and, and figure it out as you go. And, and, I, and I always try and think of like, what's the next thing we can do? I never want to sort of um, rest. And, you know, we're starting to think now about you know, the metaverse and other sort of ways to kind of bring the show to people. So um, yeah, I, I, I think the show that we do five or 10 years from now will probably be dramatically different than what we do today. But I really want to make sure that we're progressive and thinking about um, you know, how to continue to evolve the format. I think one of the things that uh, people may not understand about the show is like, it's obviously a big undertaking, but it's actually a massive, huge undertaking. And I know that, you know, you would used to come to visit us in the summer and sort of tell us what you were working on. When do you really kick the show off? Um, because, you know, being on our side, we get to see how much work it is and how personally involved you are in every yeah. piece of it. I'm just curious, like when, when does this really kick off and when does it ramp up? Yeah, exactly. You guys were in a lot of those early meetings. I mean, in a pre pandemic time, I would basically finish E3, go on vacation for a couple of weeks. And then usually early July, I would go on my kind of road show and, and visit every publisher and, and give kind of a pitch of, of what we were doing and a lot of meetings. Um, so yeah, it's, I mean, we obviously have to book our, the venue and the theater almost a year in advance, just because we, it takes almost two weeks to kind of build our show and, and put it together. So um, that stuff starts early, but yeah, for me, it really takes about half my year. I kind of start um, after the traditional kind of June E3 timeframe, uh, finished summer game fest this year, went on vacation and then came back. And, and yeah, most of the back half of the year I spend working on the show. And as you guys know, firsthand, I'm, I'm very involved in all aspects of the show, both in terms of the, distribution and the sales and the relationships with publishers and the, the world premieres and content. Um, you know, my team probably wishes I did a little bit, little bit less um, and just focused on hosting the show. But um, yeah, it, it very much, as you said, is kind of authored by me and that I'm working with a lot of the game companies um, throughout the year to put together the content, which is something I really enjoy. And I don't think the fans necessarily realize how involved we are in kind of planning out those moments. Or I think of, you know, when we did the, like the Joker reveal, um, for persona i mean that was just like a masterful moment i was actually just watching it back this weekend i'm like oh it's so good um or even that the, was a weird conversation i had to have have with you about that moment i was like so we have this idea you can that's say right. no but you really can't say no <laughs> that's right I remember, no i remember because that was a yeah that's right you and 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 bill trina and yeah we had a lot of conversations around yeah. with the the static and how that was gonna work i know the together. theater going black all that yes. random stuff that was like jeff has to be an actor now <laughs> yeah, no and i remember we had and we had rehearsals for that and it, yeah we did that live but it was i it's one of those moments where I look back at the video and I'm like, oh, it really worked well. But so much had to be coordinated with sort of the lighting and what I said and the timing and everything because it was exactly. happening live. And that's the stress of that show is, you know, if someone forgets to turn off the lights or, you know, it doesn't work. <laughs> and there was a lot of pressure around that moment because it was just so it's just such a masterful um, piece of theater about how it plays. And again, that's that's the kind of thing that you can only do at the Game Awards. And what I love about that moment is that that started in a Nintendo Direct it wouldn't have the same impact, but because it was at the Game Awards, everyone's like, oh, here's a new Persona game announcement. So when the, the envelope comes around and it flips, I mean, it's just completely out of nowhere that there's the Smash insignia there. And that's something that, he said, like in a Nintendo Direct, it wouldn't be shocking that there's a Smash logo, but for us, right. thought, oh, this is just a, you know, here's another, again, Persona franchise that wasn't even on Switch, right? That was sort of a PlayStation um, franchise that then all of a sudden was sort of popping in. It was... Uh, yeah, it was really it was it was fascinating to to go through that, and it was really fun. But as you guys know firsthand, like it's a very collaborative process um, with the game companies. And Nintendo, you know, has been a great partner um, to the show. I mean, I look, I was actually watching all the shows back this weekend, starting in 2014. I do that every year, just kind of like live through them again. And I look back at our first show in 2014, and you know, it opened and closed with big Nintendo moments. I mean, opening with Koji Kondo performing. Uh, closing with the first you know, gameplay of uh, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Um, I, I will always be indebted to Mr. Wada and Reggie and the whole Nintendo team for the support. Um, you know, in year one of that show, which as you guys were saying, that was completely new. I was doing it on the internet. No one knew was anyone going to show up. And to have, you know, Nintendo support um, at the very beginning before it was, was anything. And that's why I, I'm always so, you know, indebted to Nintendo and 
and PlayStation did the PlayStation experience around the show in 2014. Rockstar Games was a big early supporter. Like a lot of the companies really um, believed in what I was doing and I will, I will never forget that. Well, since you mentioned it, why don't we, why don't we take a closer look at the 2014 show and we specifically yeah. want to talk about, you know, Koji Kondo's involvement uh -huh. and the performances that he did, specifically the one with uh, Imagine Dragons. I have to imagine that ranks pretty high up there in terms of all the, the musical performances you've had. Oh, yeah. Uh, again, as I said, it's crazy that that was like our first year and we kind of didn't know what we we're doing, really. I mean, that show in 2014... I think we made it in about six weeks. Like I spent most of my summer trying to convince everyone that I wanted to do this show. Um, I had to, you know, figure out, could I raise the money? Could, how could I do it? We didn't have enough money really to make the show. And we did it at the Britney Spears theater in Las Vegas, uh, at the Axis. And the only reason we could do it is because Britney was kind enough to basically lend her, uh, stage set to us for the show. So if you look back at that show, all the screens and the lights are exactly the same as I think it was called Pieces of Me, which was her Vegas show. We basically just took the fire ring out and the rest of the show is basically her set that she lent to us because we didn't have enough money to kind of build a stage like we do now. Um, so yeah, it all came together extremely quickly. And that Imagine Dragons moment, um, that came together in I think the final like two or three days before the show. And then Kit, I know you were very involved in that too. And we had I'd reached out, you know, to Nintendo to talk about Koji Kondo being involved and, and doing something musical kind of at the show. Um, and he was so kind to agree to come over to the show and be a part of it. And we had, I think, originally really talked about him opening the show with the Super Mario Brothers theme, kind of with him on a piano. And that was kind of the, a big idea. And I think we hoped we were going to do something with Zelda. Um, though we really didn't know what was happening, even Mr. Miyamoto and Mr. Anuma. Um, it was, I think it was like Thanksgiving weekend. We finally figured out though, they're probably going to have something for us. And originally they had kind of said, well, we, we showed some stuff at E3 and we're probably just going to be able to show like, you know, maybe just a little bit more than that. It was very unclear. And then we got this, it was like a five minute video of them sitting there playing the game, which was like incredible. And I think everyone at Nintendo and, and, and I was blown away. I just couldn't believe it. And then, yeah, we had the idea of doing something musical uh, with, with Mr. Kondo potentially playing a Zelda theme. And then I think, I think at some point I came up with the idea of, uh, a collaboration with Imagine Dragons and thought about it, um, and reach out to the band and they were in Vegas, which is their hometown, which helped. And they were in a, in a house recording their next album. And initially I think they were really busy and they're like, well, we're not sure, but maybe Dan, the lead singer would be able to collaborate in some way. He's a huge fan of Mr. Kondo. Um, and actually remembering now the emails, they were very skeptical about doing the game awards. And the minute I mentioned Koji Kondo, they, they freaked out and they're like, wait, Koji Kondo, he might be involved. Um, I said, yeah, yeah. And they, they just, they, they instantly became way more interested in it. Um, and then, yeah, we sort of started talking about, could there be a collaboration? What could it look like? Um, yeah, kid, I remember you were, you were out there, um, Mr. Kondo and Tim and, 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 uh, I think it was, it was. You remember his very last minute, I mean, it was like sort of the week of the show. We kind of didn't really know what was going to happen. There was sort of some talk about some type of collaboration, maybe on some some Zelda music or maybe collaborating on an Imagine Dragon song or something. Um, and it really didn't take shape until we were, you remember, we were in that room. I still have a video of it somewhere of the, them meeting. It was two or three days before the show. And I think it was just going to be Dan at one point. And then when we were there, it kind of turned into the entire band getting involved with Mr. Kondo and doing something. And, and yeah, that performance to this day is such a high bar of, you know, uh, Mr. Kondo playing Zelda music and then turning into um, Imagine Dragons performing its time with Mr. Kondo. And I mean, you were part of that kid. I'm curious to get your perspective, but it was definitely, uh, it was very last minute, but uh, was so, so special. And I thought like, really to me, what I loved about that moment is that I felt like, Koji Kondo finally hopefully felt extra cool that day because he was sort of like playing with this big band. And I think he really enjoyed it. And that's a put like a Nintendo's always about putting smiles on your face. And I feel like hopefully if we put a smile on Koji Kondo's face that day, that kind of made it all worth it. Yeah. We got to meet him at the Zelda 25th anniversary concert a little bit, a few years before. But uh -huh. one, one of the things when you, you know, start talking to developers is like, you got to feel their comfort level of, of what they're okay doing. 
And we got the sense that he was a pretty, you know, calm and reserved guy. So we weren't sure, but he just ended up saying like, yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it to anything that we kept throwing his way. So I actually wasn't surprised when he gave the thumbs up to Imagine Dragons because he'd been given the thumbs up to everything. So it's like, all right, he's game for whatever. So that's great. Um, I remember we were, when we'd arrived in Vegas, it was like the day before and, and in classic Japanese developer fashion, he hadn't really thought about it or prepped much. And he's like, I need the sheet music for this Imagine Dragon song. <laughs> it's like, uh, okay. And Krista was there with us and she somehow managed to track it down. And, you know, he looks at this and he's like, this is no good. But he starts like writing the chords down on this piece of scratch paper. Which it was I think like he, a post-it note. You I, can see so it in the video. Yeah. He's got it oh, up on like the a, piano. Yeah, yeah actually, it's, a, it's like a napkin almost or something. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We were at like a little breakfast place and he's like writing it down on this napkin. And I'm like, oh boy, I'm getting a little bit worried about this now. <laughs> yeah. But, was, um, I mean, yeah, I was so amazed that that came together. And I mean, yeah, you guys both remember it was a lot was happening because we had, you know, the Breath of the Wild footage reveal. And then we had this music thing. I mean, it was a massive segment. It was probably like, you know, 10 or 15 minutes of stuff. Uh, and yeah, I was, I mean, you were with him. It seemed like he was, was he, he seemed, he seemed excited, right? Super. Yeah. He was having a great time. Um, there was a really funny moment. So when we got to the Imagine Dragons house, um, you know, there was just a lot of excitement of the meeting, you know, you, you wanted to see what this performance would be like. This was their first time being together. And I remember he sat down at the piano and put his little piece of paper and then he just sort of stared at the keys for like a minute. And I started to wonder what was going on. And he just waited so long that I was like, wait, does he not know how to play the piano? Has he been a fraud this whole time? What's going champ. on? And he just looked so like he had a strange look on his face staring at the piano. But of course, finally, believe it or not, Koji Kondo does know how to play the piano. But that was just such a <laughs> memorable start to that. And of course, it was great once they got going. I remember when we met him at the Zelda anniversary um, and I, he had gone up on stage to play the piano and he kind of did like this, a similar thing where he paused for a moment and then started playing the piano. And I, I chalked it up to like, he's on stage, this, he might be nervous, whatever. And then afterwards, I remember talking to him. I was like, oh my gosh, you, it was amazing to hear you play the piano live. Does it make you nervous to be on stage? And he was like, oh no, I was much more nervous like speaking once I sat down on the piano, I was like, this is my, this is my zone. I'm comfortable here. And um, I just thought that was so funny that for the Imagine Dragons one, he was just like, maybe he was just like mentally like getting himself prepared or something like his, that's his Maybe like, this piano. is just his routine. His I don't routine. know. Exactly. Yeah. No, that's his like, was, piano routine. <laughs> as you said, he never, he obviously never met the band before. I mean, yeah, we went to this, this house that was, I remember he said off the Vegas. Out in the suburbs. We, yeah. Yeah week of the show and they were sort of there and it was you know they'd never talked to each other before we didn't really know what was going to happen and again like it was all it, it really was only going to be dan the lead singer and him i think at that first point we're going to maybe do something together and then um i think they realized it's like oh the whole band I, I, at one point i think it was maybe going to be koji kondo on the piano just playing it's time with dan or something and it, it eventually evolved into what it needed to be which was the full band there but yeah they were just sitting around working on their new album at the time uh, and yeah, it was, it's, it, it's such a great example of a magic moment like that coming together and how that happens in the final days leading into the show. And I always say with my show, there's so much pressure that comes down the final weeks because that's where everything happens. You know, a certain celebrity guest will be there or not, or we think we're getting a world premiere that then cancels or something new shows up. And that's kind of the exciting, but also, ner you know, nerve wracking part of the show is that everything comes down to the final few days. And I remember, you know, leaving the the show and getting on probably my Blackberry at the time and telling our team, it's like, okay, we got to, you know, the full band is in and Koji Kondo are doing this. Um, and yeah, it was, it's amazing how well that came together the first year. And, and look, now we're so honored that the show is as big as it is, but yeah, back then it was really nothing. I think we had like a million live streams and we were celebrating that and, you know, to have the support from Nintendo and to have, you know, the, the, you know the talent that came out to the show and the industry that supported us um i look back and i'm just like amazed it came together the way it did because it didn't it didn't have to work out that way but yeah that's still very much a high bar uh and then last year you know we had imagine dragons come back again 
um, to do the song Enemy from Arcane, and they collaborated with uh, Super Giant Games, which was an amazing moment with uh, Darren Korb and Ashley Barrett. So they're, out of all the bands we work with, they are by far the most collaborative and open to ideas. And I, I still have somewhere, I think I made a mock-up of, you know, it was really my idea to do, like, let's do um, It's Time with Koji Kondo. And same thing last year, it was kind of this idea I pitched in of them collaborating with Super Giant. Um, and they were just always open to ideas and super collaborative. So yeah, they're they're an amazing guys, big gamers, and it really started with you know a love of Koji Kondo. And I don't think they would have played our show if it wasn't for Koji Kondo. So it was a great moment for all of us, I think, to realize how revered Mr. Kondo is, rightfully so, amongst you know popular musicians and things like that. And you know he's he's most of the time is in Kyoto doing his thing, and I you know he's not running around uh, concerts and meeting bands and things like that. I mean, probably lives a somewhat isolated life there um, in Kyoto. Uh, and so it was so nice to see that, you know, other musicians and acts, uh, you know, respect him as, as they should. And, and yeah, I, l I look back with that video and really smile um, to see the excitement around that. And it's just such a beautiful performance too. Yeah, I, th I think that's so true of a lot of the Nintendo developers and definitely a lot of people on the sound team. You know, we've then gone forward to work on so many other really cool orchestral performances for Nintendo yes. games throughout our years, whether it, sometimes it's a little stressful, but most of the time it ends up being really awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you no, laugh, well, I mean, but I know you're in pain. <laughs> oh, no. I mean, look, it's, it's, we're so honored that we get to do these musical performances. Totally. Like the, you know, the Mario Odyssey performance or mm -hmm. the Breath Smash, of the Wild performances. Yeah. Smash, exactly. Like all this stuff, which is just so rare, really to have um, you know, video game music and Nintendo music uh, performed live. Uh, and as you said, it's, it's, it's unique and special. And I think it's just crazy to me that there are not more opportunities for that. And I think we've, mm -hmm. you know, the show has veered much more in the direction of the orchestra. And that was something that we, we couldn't afford for the first three or four years of Game Awards, right? We didn't have an orchestra. And then finally, I think in 2017, we figured out a way to uh, finance it. And ever since, we're like, it's not even a question now, right? I mean, the Game Awards Orchestra has become such a signature. It's so iconic now. now. Exactly. And that big, you know, montage they do for Game of the Year um, is is stressful again, because we don't even know the nominees until the middle of November. So they really have like three weeks to put that whole thing together. But Lauren Balfour, our musical director, does such an amazing job um, putting it all together. But you said that's stressful because we have to get all the companies to agree to, you know, what piece yeah. of music's going to be played and what's the footage going to be. And again, that's all the stuff that behind the scenes, I don't think the fans appreciate about, um, you know, everyone's got to sign off on it and the order mm -hmm. and, and, and all that. And, and, and again, the game companies are very collaborative and I'm honored that it comes together, but it's just a lot of work to, um, to bring those things to life. Yeah. And it's always surprising to me, like, you know, when, whenever we worked with the Nintendo sound teams or even with, you know, Mr. Kondo, it's like, why do they want to do this? It's like, are you serious? <laughs> like, I, I feel like they're, they live, they do live in like a bit of a bubble where they're like, Oh, the music is just like a backing to the game. Like no one cares. Yeah. It's like, yeah. no, you don't understand. Like people are so emotionally moved by, yeah. um, by, by this music. It's such an inter integral part of their experience. Um, and then when they do see it brought to life, like whether it is with the, the amazing, you know, TGA orchestra or whatever, or whatever, it's like, Oh, that's what you were talking about. But it takes like that moment for even the people working directly on the music to really realize it, which is always just like kind of delightful, but also a bit of a shock for me. It's like, wow, okay, I guess you no, really didn't know. It's a very pure view, right? And Nintendo's always so been that true. way. Whenever yeah. I pitch anything, it's just like, well, why would they want to do anything more than just show the game and the gameplay, yeah. right? And why would you why would you want to have the Muppets involved? Or why would you want like, <laughs> that stuff where it's just like it's very much... It's, it's a very pure sense of like it's about the game but yeah the music as you said is so emotional and i think back to the the pandemic show we did in 2020 where we had that amazing um you know medley of uh mario songs from abbey road and even the you know a lot of people continue to come up to me and say that you know the animal crossing theme in the game of the year part um hearing it orchestrated like that i mean it brought tears to the eyes of many people that had you know played so much animal crossing that year and to hear it big and bold and orchestrated like that was so special. And yeah, I love that it can mean something to fans, but also the developers. And again, I was, as I said to you earlier, I was thinking this weekend, I'm like, oh, it's going to be so cool if like Miyazaki comes to the show and it's like, he's going to be sitting there like hearing that Elden Ring theme with our, you know, lights and, and the orchestra. And yeah, that's the stuff that we can do that is unique. And, and even on the music side, like we've moved away from just, here's a popular band coming to play a song 
that, you know, you can see on Saturday Night Live or Jimmy Fallon or something like that. I mean, the only place you're going to hear orchestra music uh, from games is probably on the Game Awards, right? I mean, there's some other concert tours and things like that, but it's just so rare um, to do it. So, yeah, we're really leaning into that. And to your point, um, you know, we've exactly, Chris, so you've lived through a lot of these years, but it, it, it feels like, you know, almost every year we end up doing something kind of musical. Um, with Nintendo, which is uh, yeah, you know, always a huge. Honor. I'm excited to be just a glor, like a great, you know, fan this year. I get to I relax, know. I get to dress up, and I get to sit there and, and enjoy. But uh, it's enjoy it all. Great. No, it's uh, the fact that we get everyone together is really special, and there's just not enough moments in the industry like that. Exactly. And we're really proud that Game Awards is really one of the few events remaining where, you know all the first party platforms are involved in the show and we've got all the third parties and it's, yeah, it's a, it's a special night. Um, so it creates a lot of, a lot of pressure for me to make sure that we do right by everyone. And that's, as you said, I'm, I'm very involved in just trying to make sure that it all fits together well. Um, and there's lots of pressure because I said, we've, you know, people expect a big audience, they expect everything to go right. And, you know, when you have 30 or 40 partners, all bringing you news and, and information, um, it's in a live show environment. It's, I have such an amazing team because it's really, you know, it's, 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 it's hard to make sure everything works. We were talking about the, you know, the Joker moments and, you know, making sure that all worked. It takes not just me, but our entire technical and producing team and everyone to sort of make sure that lands well. And, you know, we obviously only have one shot to do it. Right. So I, I, I usually breathe a huge sigh of relief at the end of the show. If, if everything kind of goes smoothly, which it yeah. I think I, I, I had a, a tear that, that year when that reveal went, I was, it was under so much pressure and I just okay. knew that if anything were to go wrong, it just would be a disaster. Like right. there was yeah. so much on the line in that moment for it to work. And yep. I, I definitely shed a tear of like relief. No, that's I remember like, oh, you. Thank God. I remember, no, I remember you, you know, had flown down early because we had rehearsals, yeah. you know, many days earlier and you were there most of the week as we were trying to sort of plan I that. Know. And, oh and again, there's also so much secrecy around those things as well, right? Exactly. That's, thing that's uh, you know, we have to be very, very careful. I don't think we even got to, you know, see that asset until shortly before it happened because one right. of the things, you know, we really like to do is try and surprise people and it gets harder and harder Hand every year. delivered. Um, the, oh yeah, the flash drive to you. Remember that? Yep. Yeah, yeah. No, and that's that's what it, that's what it really takes, right? Is that uh, you know people ask about all our security protocols, and we don't obviously disclose all of them publicly. But a lot of it is, yeah, it comes down to you know, very few people um, are involved in the you know the assets across the entire show. Um, and we're yeah. proud that we've never really had anything leak out of our show, and it's just you know it's basically just to you know try and preserve the surprise it's so hard now with you know all the leakers and other things out there but um hopefully we find a few things that you know we look back at the moment we did uh, you know certainly joker was a big reveal i think the you know the revealing of xbox series x was another one that was like a really mm. sort of big surprise yeah, that was have, a big know, one a new piece of hardware revealed for the first time on the show that no one was expecting so you know it we, we love those moments happen it also creates a lot of pressure to sort of see like how can we continue to top ourselves what can we do and as I said, we're only as good as the games that are actually being made and the companies that are willing to, to give us news and content. So it's been, it's been a little harder through the pandemic just because, you know, games have been delayed. I think even this year, like is a sort of a lighter year for game releases. Um, you know, a lot of people now ask me like, what's going to be nominated for game of the year? And I honestly don't really know. I mean, I think there are, you know, a couple strong contenders, right? Um, that, you know, I imagine, I mean, something would have to go horribly wrong for like Elden Ring to not be nominated. But then you look at, you know, um, Xenoblade and you look at, uh, you know, uh, Bayonetta and you look at, um, you know, God of War that's coming out and Stray and, and yeah, there's just, there's so many great games out there. It's going to be really interesting to see what, uh, what gets nominated. That best family game category is going to be loaded. <laughs> look Nintendo, out. watch out. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, that was, I think it was, I was watching the shows this weekend. I think it was like, yeah, last year, the year before, there was one year where literally all five nominees were Nintendo. And yeah, I said, Nintendo, this, oh yeah. I, I like Nintendo's ch chances in this category. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it's, uh, yeah, the award stuff is really, it's fascinating. And, and that also really gets me like excited. Like here we are, we're taping this in, you know, middle of October. And I really have no idea what, how the nominees are going to break down and what's going to happen. And, and, and you, you spend all year planning for the show, but really, uh, you know, it all happens in the next like month and a half when we sort of figure out who the nominees are. And that's one of the biggest challenges on this show is the race. Once you have the nominees uh, in mid-November, then we really have to make the show. And everyone's waiting on that, right? Like our production team, our sound team, everyone doesn't, you know, 
we obviously can kind of guess and, and think, hey, you know, this game might get nominated. So let's start thinking about, you know, what music would we play from it? But nothing can happen until the nominees become public. And that's another thing that's like extremely confidential. So no one really knows um, any of the nominees. So when they'll get announced, then everything starts to happen. And, you know, it's the U.S. Thanksgiving and people are just, you know, are people flying in from Japan? Like what's happening? And it's uh, it's a very stressful time, but it's nice. It's nice. It's at the end of the year, as you said, Krista, that everyone can kind of come together for that and then usually go on their way for the holidays. And it's really the last big moment of the year for the entire industry. Um, that that sort of weekend when everyone comes together for, for TGA. So we're we're honored to do it. And and given the past few years, I think I'm just so thankful that we were actually able to do the show through the pandemic. And that's something that uh, really, you know, worried me back, especially in 2020. It's like, where are we going to be able to do the show? What was going to look like? And you guys were involved in some of those conversations about like, well, what does TGA look like? Are you doing a virtual show? Are you doing a real show? And, and we had gotten into a pretty good rhythm about how to do the show every year at Microsoft Theater. Uh, and then 2020, everything had to change. And again, my team is just so incredible because we were able to kind of pivot to a virtual show and, you know, Doug Bowser was on Zoom and there was just so much, you know, conversation around how to pull that all off, what it was going to look like, how do we do it safely? Um, so we're not fully through the woods yet. I mean, COVID is still out there, um, but we are inviting fans back to the show this year and people can join us in person. And that's another thing that I think is really special too, is that the fans can be in the audience and, you guys were there. I mean, the roar of like the Joker reveal and the, you know, the, the shock of the fans and the energy, I think is another thing that makes our show really unique from other award shows is that the, the real fans are there and they get a chance to, you know, meet Reggie or, you know, be there in person, which again is like so rare. So yeah, we're, we're excited. The fans will be back again this year. Since you mentioned you've been watching through all the shows, I have to ask, do you have a single favorite reveal or a moment? I, I think I know what you might say, but we got to find out. <laughs> Well, it's, it's, it's hard because there's sort of, you know, I'll always be indebted to like that first Breath of the Wild reveal because it was just sort of the first thing we, first year, and it was just so unexpected, right? To see like Miyamoto and Anuma sitting there for five minutes just like playing the game. And it was just like gameplay. And it was, such, you know, it was odd because it was like they were playing it and it was, you know, on a screen. And it, was it surprised like, us too. <laughs> yeah. Was, yeah. Like, just made <laughs> it on yeah, their own. <laughs> yeah. That's what no one really knew. And I, I was, I had very low, I think we all had very low expectations for what that was actually going to be. Um, and I thought it was going to be something short. And then I remember getting the call. It was like a few days before Thanksgiving. It's like, oh, wait, this is way more than we thought. It's like they're basically doing a demo um, of the game, uh, for five minutes. So that was, that was really special, um, in that regard, just being the sort of the first thing in, 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 in our first show, um, over the years, I mean, there've been other ones that like the, the series X reveal was really cool to sort of reveal hardware for the first time, which is something I, you know, never thought would ever happen on one of my shows, uh, which was great. Um, yeah, the, the Joker reveal was great. Um, Bayonetta three was a great reveal. Um, yeah, I mean, it's feels like every year, hopefully there's one thing that sort of really um, is fun and surprises people. But wh which one did you think I was going to say? Well, it's not a reveal, but I thought you might have mentioned the the Reggie, Phil Spencer, Sean Layden yes. moment was a on moment. stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, was, yeah. I, yeah. I, I don't think there's been a similar moment. Obviously, you know, Reggie and Sean have, have moved on since, but yep. that, that was a great unifying moment for the industry. Yes. No, no. Uh, in terms of moments, I think that was really special to me. Um, you know, it was... It really took five years to happen. When I first started the show, I think that was my was sort of my secret dream was to do something with all of the companies together because, as I said, we're in a unique position to have Nintendo, Microsoft, and Sony all supporting the show. And for a variety of reasons, it just never came together and that I don't think all three of them were there um, or, you know, it just, it just couldn't happen. And then, yeah, in 2018, um, I give Reggie a lot of credit for that. He sort of said to me, we were at dinner in New York um, that fall, and he said, hey, you know, I think maybe maybe we should try and do that this year um, again. And we called actually Phil Spencer at the dinner um, and said, hey, would you be in for this? And yeah, we started to kind of put together the pieces for that. Um, and obviously, you know, a lot of negotiation about sort of, you know, how does that work and who says what and all that. But I think everyone was united in trying to bring that together. And there was a lot of, a lot of back and forth um, for many months really around that moment. But to your point, uh, I, it was something that I, I really thought was going to be special. I, I will say a lot of people on my team were kind of questioning, like, hmm, do you really think this matters? And do you think this is going to be special? And I was like, no, I think to the audience, like, this idea of everyone unifying around the show and coming out on stage together, just it was very symbolic, right? Um, and there were a lot of questions about, were they going to announce anything? What were they going to say? And it really was just a positive message. 
Um, but yes, that was a that was I think for me the year that the show really kind of turned the corner and that we had you know it was, went from them right into like a big orchestra performance with Hans Zimmer and it was it was just a really like it was a, it was a super special year um and that was yeah i think that was also the smash year right where we did i think we did joker and we did the smash orchestra i was, I was just watching it back and it was a, it was a really great show so i it's funny because you asked me about favorite moments but also i think of like favorite years and it's uh it's really hard because every year sort of has a special um element to it and and luckily i'm really proud of all the shows we've done but yeah that moment was was extremely special and i think you know, especially given all the the drama that's been going on this year between like Microsoft and Sony and things like that. It, it reminds us of a, a simpler time. <laughs> yeah. I think that one, that, that moment was really like really special. And, and, and to your point, it's like very symbolic. And then I, I remember the year, just that year after Reggie retired. So it was like yep. this sort of like, I think it meant a lot to him, you know, like to have that opportunity yeah. um, to do that. And obviously he's still super involved in the game awards, but like, it, it's just, an interesting sort of way, you know, to um, kind of like represent the the unity of the industry yeah. in that way. No, and they're so all special. they're friends, right? And they all knew yeah. each other, and they were all, I think, on the ESA board at the time together. And yeah, it was uh, it was special. And that was also, you know, at a time when Sony had pulled out of doing E three. So I remember, you know, there were rehearsals and sort of joking like, "Oh, this is, you know, you're not going to see this at E 3 And it was like the three of them. Sort of <laughs> um on stage and stuff so it was uh yeah i was i it, it really it meant a lot to me personally and i also think as you were saying kid i think it was a it was a signature moment for the show because i think it really showed that that something that only the game awards could do and i think that was really you know unifying for the industry and also the audience to see that happen so yeah that was definitely a one of those moments i will look back on as you said that probably probably will never happen again right it was just sort of the you know the right place and right time for that to come together um really you know strong response from the audience too. I was actually even more happy about how people responded to that moment. It was really sort of, you know, galvanizing for the fans, uh, which was, was, which was really nice to see. Well, Jeff, it was great to catch up and we're really yeah. looking forward to the show this year and we'll be there. Yeah. I love it. Fantastic. Well, yeah, we're thrilled to have you there. We are deep in production now. Um, have, I think it's like, you know, six ish weeks to sort of pull it all together and, and, there's a lot to do, so uh, stressful time, but we're, we're honored to do it. And yeah, I, I can't wait to have you guys there covering all the, the news and announcements. And uh, yeah, we'll see you uh, December 8th for the Game Awards. Can't wait. It's can't date. wait. Thank see you, you so there. much, Jeff. Thanks, guys. We're, we're yeah, so very sure. honored to have you on the show. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me by. And uh, who, who's the third guest going to be? Do you know yet? TBD. TBD. Okay. But the, you and Reggie were our two, like must have in the first okay. round of guests and and we were able to get both of you so we're we're just so grateful for all of all of the support and um yeah we can't wait to see you in la awesome thanks guys talk soon all right and we're back jeff has left us to go play god of war apparently <laughs> 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 um so good for him it was so great you know to catch up with jeff and, and like we were saying before when we were first thinking about doing this, like even before we, you know, we're, on, we're in the, the process of leaving Nintendo and, and sort of fiddling with an idea, a seed of an idea to do this. The people we went to were like Reggie, Jeff, you know, um, and, and Jeff was, has always been so encouraging. And he also is like a great example of someone who has been just a risk taker. And he, you know, has so much knowledge and goes with his instincts and just like goes for stuff. And I think that really inspired us to like go for this, you know? So it was just wonderful to catch up with him and, and talk with him. Yeah. He is a remarkable person and has been a great friend to us. And it was nice to catch up with him uh, again here. And uh, who that Koji Kondo story. I really thought he couldn't play the Legend. piano for a second, just for a second. What's, <laughs> what is happening right now? He does have that look on his face sometimes, very serene. It was like, oh, the jig is up. <laughs> the whole, you know, however old, 50 year, whatever years, it's over today. <laughs> My life is a sham. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no, he is maybe like one of the most wonderful people ever to have graced this planet. And um, even my mother is a huge fan of Koji Kondo. Really? And when I told her about this, I showed her the Nintendo Minute video we did 
um, earlier earlier that day right. <laughs> with Koji Kondo. Right, and right. And she was just like, oh my gosh, can you just tell him that I love the Mario uh, underwater theme? I think it's amazing. And oh, I just, that's great. I, I'm so inspired by, by him. Like, transcends you know generations yeah. and and people and gosh it's it's amazing so for our um never a minute segment this week we're, we're changing our schedule up a little bit because yeah what we did last week was maybe a bit too much on the scary side where totally, you talk totally. talking about like being stuck in an actual haunted hotel yeah um so Didn't we are that. we are reshuffling and today we are doing the Halloween candy tier list. This is how to help you prepare for your Halloween night. Yeah, I mean, you you should know this well before Halloween. You know, don't True. get this, get that, stuck up on that. Yeah, um, yeah. So we have 15 different Halloween candies. Mm-hmm. that we're gonna, I'll just read them off in no particular order. Yes. Starbur- Starburst, candy Whoa. corn, Twix, Reese's peanut butter cups, M&M's, Skittles, Blow Pops, Snickers, Tootsie Rolls, Kit Kats, Butterfingers, Jolly Ranchers, Sour Patch Kids, Nerds, and Nestle Crunch. Of course, there are many more. Right. These are the first ones that came to mind for us. Yeah, we kind of blind, blinded this. Right. So, yeah, these are the ones that came to mind. So, uh, S through F, I have prepared mine. You have prepared yours. I certainly uh, have. I, th- I think this is going to be contentious. Um Let's good thing, press- good thing we're doing this podcast remotely, lest lest I come across I know, I'm the so non-existent bummed. table. I'm a little bummed because I was thinking like for if we were doing this in person, we could have brought our favorite can the S tier one, if you have any, mm. right here, and then shared. Next but week. Okay. Next week. Next week. Next we week. Plenty of really- time. Can- plenty. Candy. Yes. I think next week when we film, it's actually Halloween Day, and we'll be in like maybe we'll be in a costume. Next so. week? Is it next week or the week after? Uh, today is October 17th, so my friend. <laughs> we have my two weeks. My dates in October <laughs> has got me all in a tizzy, it guys. scrambled your brain. My brain has been um, candy scrambled. All right, okay, well, let's, let's work our way up to the top. I mean, should we start with the F, the F tier? Yes. All right. Um, uh, what you got? In the F tier, I have two things. Mm-hmm. One is candy corn. I don't know if that will be contended much. Uh, I also have that in the F tier. Okay. And that is my only thing in the F tier, actually. I have one more. Really? The Nestle Crunch Bar. Unfortunately, in my F tier. Really? Sorry to tell you. Sorry to tell you. Why? It's like nothing. That is the worst tasting chocolate. It's not... Don't even sully the name of chocolate by calling that chocolate. It is brown colored sugar with like sand in it it's disgusting isn't it pretty much the same chocolate that's in all of the other chocolate based things on this list but i think it's because of the texture it makes it taste extra gross not uh, a fan. wow um f i will not reveal tier. where i have that but it's quite a bit higher i like Whoa. those i should say ew i don't really like candy <laughs> So maybe it's weird for me to be doing this at all. I could just put it all on the F list. I'm not a big fan of candy. There's many other things I'd rather eat than than most of this stuff. You definitely are not like a sweets person at all, except for like pie. Um, And even with pie, I feel like you always choose like not so sweet pies Mm. usually, like a pumpkin pie or something like that, which is like a little bit more like, you know, like spiced versus sweet. Um, I'm not really a big candy fan either but i am and you're don't call me a snob because i know you're going you're going to i am particular about chocolate and it needs to be a certain percentage of oh my gosh cacao, so. well yeah i'm sorry you're it's... already you're already starting your your like you're already starting to get mad i'm sorry a snickers did not have 90 percent cacao content in the chocolate i'm very particular i get my chocolate from wow anyways, i'm not gonna go i'm not gonna go so this is the further. candy snobbery section this is where um, i get like canceled for my candies on to d oh the, d, d, d d is where i could get in oh, some what, hot no, water e. we have e i do not have an e no this is like a let this is like grades did you ever oh. get an e in school there's no e it goes oh, to the d list has an has e in it too all right then my e is empty what do you have e for empty blow pops and tootsie rolls e okay tier. Uh, explain your grievances against both of these. Well, the, I actually don't hate lollipops, honestly. Like those are fine or like popsicles are okay. So it's not like the pop part, or not, not the lollipop part of it. But my grievance is that you should not combine gum with hard candy. But it's inside the hard candy. That's just weird. 
That's just uh, weird. Do you have an issue? Like, uh, okay. Maybe like a close relative of the blow pop is like a gusher. How do you feel no, about no, that? No, that's not a close relative. I mean, it's got like, something you, else inside the candy. That's actually like kind of like gushers. All right. The, the, secret like, with, the secret with the blow t- the blow pop is just throw it away when you get to the gum. Exactly. Like, yeah. why do you have that there then? You it is kind of I mean? weird gum inside. And they have that weird commercial. It's like, how many licks does it take to get to the center of a blow pop? And well, that's, like, a toots- that that's a Tootsie Roll. Excuse you. Oh, a that's Tootsie Pop. That's tootsie. Oh, that's a Tootsie Pop. You're tootsie right, Pop you're right. is not on our list. Oh, maybe maybe was, wow. Maybe the market the marketing about... guy at the Tootsie Roll Corporation just got fired because you said that. Good. He's on the streets. Well, the Tootsie Roll is also in the E tier, so get on those. <gasps> get on the streets and get some better chocolate. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah, gross. Both of those are I would never I would never reach for that in the You would never role. stoop so low. I okay. Would never stoop so low. Uh gross. my D okay. Here, let me go let me do my D tier now. These okay. all have a similar theme. Uh-huh. And again, people are not going to like this. Oh, I have Sour Patch Kids. <laughs> oh. I have Skittles. I have Skittles in mine I, too. I have Starburst. Oh, you have Starburst. And I have Nerds. You don't like fruity candy. These are all fruity, fruity flavored candy. But in a like, anytime I eat these, it's, fruit. it's like my teeth are going to fall out in three, two, one. Yeah. There's something about it that is not good. That's true. I I definitely have that sense when I eat Skittles. I think it's the the texture that gritty chewy texture of a skittle that makes it make, makes it feel as like sticking to my teeth yeah, it's like i'm never gonna I get, can't this out. get it off yeah, yeah. <laughs> um so skittles is in my d tier as well um i i have starburst sour patch kids in my c tier though because i think those are a little less offensive and i do kind of like sour things like yeah sour candies um so i i, I put that i but those that are like a little bit. coated in that sugar it is. It's, it's like very I don't sugary. think I should be doing this. And it's always it's always like an, an ungodly, unnatural color. It's yeah, like this does yeah. not exist in nature. Like this neon right. color. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Uh, your your D tier. Just Skittles. Just Skittles. All right. And then so, s- your C tier. Onto my C. Now. I have Butterfinger, Kit Kats, and Tootsie Rolls. I have there. The, bu- the Butterfinger is a weird one because it in the first bite, it's like, I like this. And then on the second bite, it flips I to, this. I never want to taste this again. Throw I have, um, so Starburst and Sour Patch Kids is in the C tier. I also have Butterfingers in my C tier. Oh. Same, same problem. It's like, at first I'm like, this could be okay. And then suddenly I'm like, no, I don't want, I don't like this. Maybe I'm like, if it's like a, the smaller, ver- like just the one biter. Yeah. What is it? Butterfinger bits or whatever it's I called. don't have a clue. I, I feel like fun that size? they have that. The fun size. Well, yeah. I'm not eating like the, the giganto king size Butterfinger here. Yeah. The, I, can the bar- fun I can barely size, choke the down one, the fun size. One bite is like, okay. Um, the other one I have, I know that people are going to come at me for this. Sorry. I'll say this in advance. Twix. Um, Twix. Have, have you said Kit Kats yet? Oh no. Because I feel like Twix and Kit Kats are kind of no. like, they're, they're, don't, they're don't on the same dare. block. They're Don't, on the same block. You cannot put Kit Kats and Twix in the same block. That Why is not? offensive. Twix has a terrible texture. That cookie caramel combination is awful. No uh, one wants that. Okay, well, let's go on to my B tier where the first thing on it is Twix. Twix is superior to Kit Kats. <sighs> that I is mean, absolutely incorrect. No. I mean, what? first of all, get, that's my name. Leave it alone. You cannot have it. Uh, you'll be hearing from my lawyers. And Your then name it's is like, not Kit Kat. what? What is what is in a Kit Kat? Like a wafer or something? Yes, it's like delicious. It's basically styrofoam. The no, Twix it isn't. You liar. The, the thing in a Twix is much more substantial. Ew, um, no, I don't like that substantial. I like it when it's like airy and crispy, and it's too heavy in a. I also don't like the, that kind of caramel. It's not good. Okay. It's a weird. It tastes weird and has a weird texture. I don't like that. Uh, what's what do you have in B? Reese's peanut butter cups, M and M's, but only the peanut one. Not we we didn't specify the M and M, so you can probably just say what, what version you're you're talking about. I do kind of like peanut M and M's. You know this because I used to eat out of that giant jar. Those are good M and M's in the office. Those Remember are good. That? Yeah, I kind of like those. Those are good. I like. Yeah, I you, like, you would just I like you would just peanut l- butter. You would just lick your fingers and put your whole hand into this into this grab bag, like, and everybody else would just walk like, away like. 
We had a to do giant. That. It was like a Costco. It was for like filling up gumball machines. It's or not. Something. It's like, not sanitary. It was not sanitary. I stayed but it far was away from that. Massive. Um, but I do like. I do like peanut butter a lot. A yes. Lot. Yes. And um, then why is pe- why is Reese's peanut butter low, so low? What do you mean Reese's peanut butters and peanut M and M's are in B? They're you just said you love peanut butter, so I mean B is like kind of middle of the road. No, I think B is pretty good. All right. It's a it's a positive B. It's a positive B. All right. Yeah. B is uh, good. On to my Average. A. I mean, we're A. We're getting up here. Like this is like stuff that I will actually eat. Oh my gosh. Uh, I'm I have I have in I you. have Jolly Ranchers. Oh, me too. Me too. So Yay, I, don't, I don't know why the Jolly Ranchers works for me, whereas those other ones in my D, the fruity ones, don't work. Okay. The it's sour only- apple, the sour apple Jolly Rancher is 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 quite a special creation. Uh, obviously made in a lab and a, is an abomination of nature, but it is quite yeah, delicious. It's chemicals. Yeah. No, the the only Jolly Rancher that I, I will say sour apple is like probably okay as well. But the one that I love the most is watermelon. That is, I actually don't oh, even. Oh, that's a good I, one too. I hate real actual watermelon. Like I don't eat any watermelon because it's a so weird. I don't like the sandy taste there of we watermelon. Go. But I do love artificial watermelon. This is like a weird thing. It's also so something I, about the smell. It smells so good. Like, yeah. where is the Jolly Rancher watermelon candle? Give it to me. <laughs> I want it now. <laughs> Christmas gift. Give it to me. Um, but yes, now I kind of want one. That those are very good. Yeah, so that's my A tier as well. A tier. Um. So I had Jolly Ranchers, M and M's, and I had the Nestle Crunch there. I actually quite like <gasps> that, and I'm and I'm quite upset that you had that last. I can't believe that you have Nestle Crunch in your A tier. It's good. Have you never had like a good chocolate bar? I don't want ever? it. But if it's like, if I have just like, there's some like thing of chocolate and pe- sometimes people get weird like, eat one, you have to eat one. It's like, all right, fine. I'll take the Nestle Crunch. It's not too big. Um, I like the crunch. I like, you mm-hmm. know, whatever, what are they, it's like basically like Rice Krispies in it's there. It's Rice Krispies. That's treats, nice. Yeah. What's you not do to like, like Rice Krispie Treats. You're a Rice yeah. Krispie Treats fan. Maybe that's What's not why. to like? It's, Yo, it weirdo. doesn't taste like anything. It tastes like sugar. Like, tastes like nothing. Um, uh, the other one I have in here that you're going to be disappointed at is Nerds. I do like Nerds. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I mean, no, I get fun to eat. In defense now, of Nerds, they are small. So you can like, actually have like two little, little. Yeah, you can get a little. Yeah. Just a little. And now they have Nerds Rope. Okay. What's that? It's like they coat the this like kind of like gummy thing. Oh. And around it is nerds. It's actually kind of good. It's actually kind of good. That sounds like it's, it's a road too far for it's me. A, it's a good like movie snack. This is madness. Sometimes. All right. It's good. Uh, into the S. S. Get ready. Kit Kat bars, you. I can't believe you. <laughs> uh, what What else? Think about. That's it. <laughs> you did not. You did not play Snickers, I think. Oh, I need to play Snickers. Oh, I didn't play Snickers. Because I have I Snickers at the top of my list. S tier, Snickers. Oh, I'll put that in B. Okay, I have Snickers and Reese's peanut butter cups in S. Those are the two kings. <gasps> oh, because the peanut butter. You like peanut butter. The peanut. Okay, okay. okay. It, there are versions of like it's basically a Reese's peanut butter cup, but it has better peanut butter in it. Those are really good. You can find those sometimes. And the Snickers is yeah. just like a great combination. It's like you got the nuts, you got the nougat, you got the what is nougat by the way? Sugar. <laughs> <laughs> it's all just sugar. It's just sugar. That's why I felt like the Milky Way. It's like, well, this is all nougat, and I don't know what nougat is, so I'm kind of out on the Milky Way. I'll put all my peanut related candies in B because okay. I think that 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 fits well with the with the M and M's and the Reese's peanut butter cup. And then, yeah, for sure, I can't believe you. What? Those Kit Kats? All the del- I mean, the regular Kit Kat is already pretty good. Now they have dark chocolate Kit Kat. They got Oreo. Well, you're not Kit talking Kat. about some Japanese like artisanal got... Kit Kat, are you? Well, I'm talking the regular Kit Kat. I really the regular Kit Kat I quite like. That doesn't count. Already. This is this is America, Jack. We don't have those here. <laughs> this is America. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we got a banana. Um, no, but I I do love the regular Kit Kat. If it, that's in a Halloween mixed bag or whatever, I I will pick those out and eat it. Do you do you Give always break, break it in half, or are you just like <laughs> bite? No, into I the always whole break thing? it in half. Breaking right. off a piece of that? Oh, Come my, on. Oh, my gosh. Kit Kat. Uh, well, I hope the check right. from Kit Kat Corporation cleared for you. I never got it. Um, I love Kit Kats. I'm so disappointed that you do not agree with me on this. Interesting That's to see the differences here. Really a watershed moment All right. for us, honestly. Well, uh, please, as always, pledge your allegiance to uh, you or Kitty me. Kitty or Christopia. Yeah. 
based on the candy selection. I'm That's right. right. Um, <laughs> before we, it, kind of a related thing before we move on to what we're playing. Inverted we also, controls? I was going to say, we, po- right about that. we posted also another right. uh, poll about inverted or non-inverted controls. Uh, I have Post to say. Post a poll about Kit Kat. I have to say that the non-inverted controls are winning quite handily. Yeah, exactly. You know, what's that? How does that saying go? Like genius is rarely recognized in its time. No, that's. I feel like in the year like twenty, you know, twenty ninety nine, when we're all in our flying cars and my brain is in a jar, uh, (laughs) I think we're all going to be playing inverted. When you're plugged into a a human conscious, yeah, into like your human consciousness from a machine, and you're in the metaverse. I guess we'll be inverted. Yeah. Fine. So I can live with that. Um, I think you should. But that was, that was interesting. That was interesting how lopsided that was. You need to take some lumps for that because you have been on a high horse for a long time and I don't appreciate it. Well, what's really important is that this has no bearing at all on our ongoing challenge uh, leaderboard, (laughs) which you're, you're in a, in a dark place right now. That's all I have to say. Someone Uh, else came out. In defense of the cooking challenge, I'm just again. I listen. Say don't get me. Listen, okay. Briefly, I, I will say this I br- say briefly. People, say people need to appreciate more the disadvantage that I was in by having your own mother grading my food versus That's yours. Not and off camera. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. T- I'm gonna tell this story off camera. Off camera when we were done. That pot of soup went back into the house, and when I came back, it was all gone, and it was just a round of applause, a standing ovation for me. Okay. And I don't, I don't, I didn't see that with yours. It did happen with mine. It didn't happen. The family ate it. There was nothing left. They choked it down. <laughs> they didn't. It was good. <sighs> Next was time, good. my mother's house. We'll see what happens then. Oh. I'm going to have a conversation with her first. I'm really good with mothers. Dear mother. I I can really, I can really, I can really gain this one. (laughs) Oh gosh. All right. All right. Moving on. Speaking of games, what we're playing. Yes. What we are playing. Woof. Um, we definitely are playing a lot of Mario Bros. Rabbids. Let's we'll start there. Let's start there because yeah. we're both playing that game. You were you were um, um, much further ahead than I am somehow. I somehow got really sucked into this game. Like, I was really surprised. Um, definitely enjoyed what I played at the preview, and then we did that first hour together, which was really great. Um, and then I went off on my merry little way and just like started like you know playing my own my own game and. Okay, I gotta say that I love the the different difficulty settings. Like mm. that has made a world of difference for me. Because I think I talked about this before, but like the last game was really hard, and it the difficulty like went up pretty high towards the middle of the game, where it was hard for me to get through it. It did, and it was frustrating when I had to restart battles, like over and over again because they were quite long as well but this time the difficulty settings and you showed it during our first hour playthrough is like really customizable it's not just like hard medium you know easy or whatever it's like you can customize like all different kinds um of settings and i like tuned it so it's like perfect for me you know it's just the right amount of challenge it's not like i'm immune to everything i still feel like i need to try to like be strategic but i don't feel like oh shoot i'm gonna my team is going to, you know, this is going to be a blowout and I have to like redo this battle over and over again. So I really love that. And, and I really love all the, the, like the world exploration stuff. Like those little different areas you go to are really robust. Like it's, there's a lot to do in each of those areas. And I was surprised by that. Yeah. So you're, you're in the third area. I am. I'm in the second. the second. Yeah. And the reason I'm a little bit behind is, so there's a certain like minimum, you know, critical path to, to move on from each planet. I did that on the first planet. And then I was like, Oh, I'm just going to kind of poke around and see what else is here before I move on. And I actually spent like a couple days still on that Island finding new things to do. There were puzzles mm-hmm. that I couldn't solve before where something had unlocked that I could do it again. Again, like those areas don't look that big, but they are really packed with stuff to do. And it was all really fun. Yeah. I actually, was really, again, surprised by that because they're the side things that you can do in each of those areas just through your exploration is like 
almost like a game in and of itself because like it doesn't come to you unless you like stumble upon a character or stumble upon um, like a mysterious doorway or a path or something like that. That only comes from you like walking around that area and stuff like that. So that like sort of um, focus on like getting you to do that exploring is like very like prevalent in the game. Like they, they really like want you to do that and they really reward you when you do. So it's really cool. Like I, I really like that. And then of course, like the game is still building, like, there's been some surprises that I won't spoil um, that I've encountered that I've just, I've laughed. <laughs> I had a, a gasp moment, which was really fun. Um, you're still like getting new abilities as well, like to interact with the environment. Like in the snow area, you get an ability to help you interact with some of the things in that environment that helps you solve some of the puzzles. And it kind of adds on as you go to different areas. And it's, it feels like, like it's all like very like rewarding. So it's like, Oh, like, I can't do this yet, but maybe if I get this new thing, I can go back and like, you know, see if I can unlock that part that I wasn't yeah. able to before. The thing that I keep being really impressed with is like all the strategic possibilities and the ways that you build up your characters. So, yeah, you know, there's, I forget how many total there are, but there's probably like, you know, a, a, a couple less than 10 characters in the game and they all have their own unique weapons and attributes. So that's like a starting point. And then there's a, a pretty detailed skill tree where you can do like pretty specific builds. So like you could build a Mario that's all about, you know, jumping up into the sky and like stomping on people and, and doing those like up close attacks, or you can do a completely like range based character. So there's a lot of flexibility with that. So you add that onto the unique attributes of the characters. And then there's these sparks, which are basically the rabid Lumas who you know, give you kind of a passive trait and also a special ability. And there's it's a lot. I don't know the exact number. There's a lot of those though. There's there, a lot. It's kind of like it's kind Still of like a Pokemon ish. Them. I mean, it's not as yeah. many as as a Pokemon game, but there's a lot. Um, so you just feel like I have so many options at my disposal to make these characters and take on these these battles. Um, that's been one of the most exciting things for me. Yeah, and the sparks, they're they're all really unique too. So like you can like really strategically match it up with the type of character you're building. Like I really like using um, Rabid Mario because he's like a brawler character. And I matched him with the spark that like lets you pull enemies closer to him because he's like a close range character. So there's like so many different like ways you can use um like use the sparks and like customize it. So yeah, it's, it's, it's really cool. And um, the other thing that you and I were talking about with this game, that's um, that we were both really impressed by is like, it does definitely has like its own unique style, like the look of it. Like it, you were saying that kind of feels almost like a Skylanders game a little bit. I think it has like a very, like kind of a movie sort of cartoon kind of look to it, but it definitely feels unique in that way like it, they built a special yeah like feel for it. it it was very hard for me to describe it to you it, it's just like i don't feel like they make a lot of games that like feel this way where you know the gameplay yeah. is very expertly crafted and it's very deep but it's it's a very light-hearted experience like the graphics are all very colorful the sound mm -hmm. effects are done a certain way that's just very like fun you know, the story, you know, has depth, but it's also very lighthearted. And it's like, oh, this is nice. You know, not every game needs to be like a dark, dramatic quest for Kratos to find himself. Um, <laughs> you know, we can also have this this fun stuff, too. Yeah. Um, they really got that right. And I think also, like, you know, with the first Mario and Rabbids game, so much of the surprise of that game was the fact that it didn't suck. Because I think <laughs> that's what everybody expected. Was like, wow, Mario and Rabbids, that's going to be a train wreck. So there was just like, wow, this is pretty good. I, I like this. And they've taken so many steps forward with this new game to just build on that idea. I I, I am like, this is going to be, I, I need to finish it, obviously. I think this is going to be pretty high up on my game of the year list. Yeah, I'm really, again, really surprised. Um, I did like the first game, so I'm not like that surprised that this is really good. But just like the how far it's come from the first game is like, pretty monumental and then yeah I, I agree I think it has like I'm really glad and this is hard to do like when you have IP as like recognizable as Mario and also rabbits 
like they they already have like a very unique brand identity like both those things but then to bring it together and make it feel like unique together like that to give it like its own like special twist like that's really hard to do and make it so that like it feels like different than a mario game or a rabbits game like that that is really tough to do so huge kudos to the development team for for doing it yeah, but yeah i'm like deep i'm like deep in this game this third area is really fun so hmm. i'm spending a lot of time there um and um the game says i'm 27 percent of the way through so Still it's hard to tell. Is it like is it like twenty seven percent of like a completionist playthrough or twenty seven percent of the main story? I can never tell. I don't know. Some of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. I'm enjoying it quite a lot. Right. Um, and I'm going to be playing on the plane to New York. That's sure. right. Have you um, put aside Deathloop, or is that still? Are you still juggling those? I played a little bit of Deathloop this week. Um, I didn't get like too much further. It's pretty. It, it's pretty hard. Like the, oh. like the difficulty does like go up pretty high. So um, I'm still stuck in like the third loop, I think. Um, but yeah, I, I'm still kind of, that game is easy to like pick up and play for like, you know, an hour and then put back down. Um, but yeah, I, I will say that I'm, I'm still enjoying it quite a bit. And um, yeah, I, I hope I can get a little bit further because <laughs> it's pretty hard. Um there, there's still it's still good though it still has like multiple ways for you to get through a loop and different like items and you you're i'm still able to like like customize my characters sort of like hades where you can you like walk away with some things yeah that you can um add to your character to help you in the next run through um so so yeah I, i'm kind of I'm, I'm definitely playing it not as much as i was last week but because i'm very deep into rabbits but um yeah it's still it's still really fun and i think you should try it i mean it's on game pass so I saw a lot of Why people not? in our in our Discord um, talking about like yeah I should I should get around to that and it does look cool and again you really helped me last week kind of get over my apprehension so yeah yeah I think I'll I'll try and find a, a bit to squeeze it in yeah yeah all right what else is on this list here uh, you have Pilot Wing sixty four which I I had to double check that I didn't put that on myself in like a fever <laughs> You're like, dream wait no I did I I tried it out um, and again. I um I never had a Nintendo sixty four, so I think this is the first time I played this game. But um, it's 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 weird. It's very nineties. You can tell that it's like I'm from the nineties. But it has like the pilot pilot wings like vibe. You know, it's like super relaxing. You're on like Holiday Island, which is basically Luhu Island. Let's be real. Um, and you're like flying around, and there's like three things that you can you can do the sort of like the hang glider, the jetpack, and the um like the airplane, the glider plane or whatever it's called. And I am terrible at everything except for the jetpack. Because you got to so... invert. No, that is a game that you do not invert. Uh, <laughs> because when you fly an actual airplane, that is how you fly it's it. It's inverted. It's not. You push down. Oh my gosh. You can't. I can't have this discussion. All right, whatever. Um, I, um, I didn't own this game growing up. I rented it once. I was a big fan of the original Pilot Wings. This there was kind of a strange tonal shift between the original and this one. Like the original Pilot Wings is like it's like basically like a Japanese like jazz bar where it's like <laughs> it's like it's fun but it's like really sophisticated and you're like yeah this yeah. music it's like wow I'm like I'm an adult now. Um <laughs> whereas Pilot Wings 64 felt a bit like goofier. It's super goofy. Like when you don't land right, it's like, whoa! You, like, yeah. Your character like screams in this like really comical way. Yeah. So I was a bit put off by that, but I do remember like they had this thing where you could fly around basically the United States and they had all the landmarks, which yeah. I thought was super cool. That's cool. Um, yeah, it's very cool. Did you do that at all? No, I didn't get that far. Oh yeah. I remember they had like, there it's was, like hard. Mount Rushmore and there might've been like a space shuttle in Florida or yeah, something. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I haven't had a chance to go back to this, but I really want to do that. I've also seen um, some people saying like this game got a pretty big performance boost um, yeah. on NSO, which, which is nice. There's, That's what I heard too. Yeah. A lot of the Nintendo 64 games there, like they run really smooth and they look kinda, pretty crisp. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of an underrated thing. Yeah, no, it definitely ran really smooth. Um, again, never played the original, so I don't remember, Yeah, but maybe um, I'll play that on the plane pilot wings on an airplane. 
Oh, look at me. Someone in our Discord was like, I need a playlist for, I was, they were playing Pilot Wings and they were like, I need a playlist for songs and video games that give you the sense of flight. And they, oh. in the music channel, and so many people responded with great soundtracks. And I was like, oh, this is like a playlist that you can make. Yeah. With yeah. like flights. And someone was like, I'm getting on a plane. It's perfect. I right. loved it. It was so cute. Um, um, I also uh, shamed you into starting Disney Dreamlight Valley. <laughs> That's the name of the game, right? Disney Dreamlight Valley? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Disney Dreamlight Dream Light Valley. Right. Um, you did Self proclaimed number one Disney fan had not tried this game. It's on Game know, Pass. Know, know, What's know, the know. deal? I did I did get it on Game Pass. It's so cute and good. Oh my god. I'm I don't know why I didn't play it sooner. I was busy. That's why. <laughs> um I have a life sometimes. But no, this game is good. Like of course I spent like an hour on the character creation screen and um so that was the first part of that playthrough you had a surprising and you had a surprising revelation about the character creation. i did you apparently already knew about this and i was like totally oblivious, i'd seen but... some rumblings about this oh because you know how we were talking about for when we do game of the year goaty game of the year we're also going to do Bodhi, but booty of the year this character she's got she's got booty wow Princess Booty. <laughs> <laughs> she is looking great. Um, yeah, I was very surprised by that. I was like, oh, oh, hey, girl. Yeah, you get that. You do the squats. Okay. Um, so that was fun. And then, yeah, you like get dropped in. It's very like you're in the Dis Disney universe immediately, which I loved. Because like the whole premise is like, I'm leaving the, this is like going to be me in like 10 years. I'm leaving the big city to move to the country where I can like relax and be away from like nonsense. So like, yeah, this is, I'm, I'm, I like this vibe. So you go and then like you like go to your like new cottage home in the woods and you like fall asleep and you, you're, you're in a dream and the dream is like, you're in this like Disney universe Dreamlight Valley, as it were, and there's like this terrible thing that's happened where like there are all these like dark vines that are like infesting the valley, and you have to like get rid of them. And that's well, the whole premise. I'm uh, still a little unsure what this game is because I asked you, and you said it's like Animal Crossing, and then you proceeded to describe something that sounds absolutely nothing like Animal Crossing. <laughs> well, there's there's definitely elements of it uh, of Animal Crossing because you do like redo and decorate your house. You do a lot of like farming and all sorts of you know like like building and collecting of of crafting. Like you do all that stuff. But there there's also this sort of like adventure type element where again you're trying to like get rid of this like evil that's in Dreamlight Valley and and bring it back to its former glory and along the way you're meeting like a lot of disney characters and you're helping them with their little quests and they're helping you you know um yeah so there's there's a the sense of sort of that type of gameplay as well and so like when you first start your um your first encounter is with like the wizard merlin um from sword and stone and and um and then you like meet mickey right away and scrooge mcduck and like so you you do meet a lot of disney characters like immediately um, and then you're like also uncovering their memories. There's one part that I really want to get to that's really cute. There is like a dilapidated um, Ratatouille cafe. Oh. And I guess like um, Le uh, Remy is going to come soon. I guess if you like do this, the, the beginning quest, like he comes and you can um, farm and like give him the recipes to make into like food and stuff like that. Like do like the cooking part. So that sounds really cute and fun. Is there know. any um, Star Wars or Marvel in this? I don't no that could be a I way in for me i mean if it's just you, like this you standard... and iron man have coffee at, Le no. at remy's and you I mean, look if at Bodhi? if it's just the standard <laughs> disney stuff i'm probably not interested okay. in that but if i could kind of make this into a star wars game i don't know I, hey you could look it up mm. or, i mean you could you could tell me i can look it up <laughs> you could right. do the work for me <laughs> the whole like dreamlight valley looks like disneyland Though. okay it's like it feels like main street it does look it looks castle. nice and well done from what i've seen beautiful yeah like and then there's like a lot of like like music cues and like things that are very disney like you can yeah. like you hear that little like chime sound you're like oh it's a disney game you know so it's good it's it's fun it's really it's really well done and i'm gonna keep playing it for sure all of a sudden, your uh, proverbial cup runneth over with all these games i know what are you gonna do? I, need to, I need to like this is a period of Still a period of quite quite a period of dabble, but um, God no more is is forthcoming. It's come incoming, incoming. The dabbles so, and the dalliances are over. 
No, it's not. We're still in the we, dabble phase. There is a strong push in our Discord um, for us to play Bayonetta 3. We'll talk more about that later. Oh, yeah. Um, Lots to say about that. But now, now that we got Mario and Rabbids early, I'm like, could I squeeze that in? 27% of the way there. I don't know. Got uh, because I, I, New York. <laughs> again, I need, I need to be done with whatever I'm doing by uh, God of War time. So, mm. I don't know. I don't know if I'll... Anyways, let's not talk about that right now. Okay. All right. We can talk about it later. Um, but yes, Shocktober you know, continues to be fun in a <laughs> game-filled way. Not you know, scary. You know what we can talk about? Now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you so much for uh, BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. We're excited. Um, we have talked a lot about BetterHelp and we've talked a lot about this idea of going to therapy for small and, and big things alike. Um, and one of the small things really is like focus, right? I think it's talking about multitasking and all the things that you have to get done in your day and all that stuff. Like it really can get a bit overwhelming at times to focus on problems and, um, you know, focus on solutions instead of just the problem itself and like get yourself and your brain and really train your brain to be in like a problem solving mode. Um, and that's what um, BetterHelp can, can help you do, which is great. And I think perspective is also another part of that. Like, you know, if there's something that's sort of looming in your mind, you can build it up to be bigger than it is to the point where you're kind of paralyzed. It's like, I don't know what to do about this. So talking to a better help therapist can help you kind of break it down, understand what you need to do and, and not be so worried about it and help it sort of fit into the big picture of your life. Yeah, I, I think for me personally, that was the big thing is sometimes you need that outside party. So you're not just telling yourself stuff in your own head, or even if you talk to like someone, you know, you know, it's like they already have like some biases or some like internal perceptions about you and maybe the, the problems you're you're trying to solve so having this like completely neutral third party is really really helpful to kind of get yourself out of that like rut a little bit and that's that's my sort of my personal um favorite thing about seeing a better help therapist yeah. when you want to be a better problem solver therapy can get you there Visit betterhelp.com slash kittenkrista today to get 10% off your first month. That's better, H-E-L-P dot com slash kittenkrista. Thank you again. We'll put the link here and also in the description box. Yeah. All right. On to the news. All right. Back with the newsy news. Sadly, That's it's not, not a great... uh, It's not good news this week. It really wasn't, and we've this all, all happened over the weekend. Yeah, we, and it we've only like, got two stories, and they're both kind of bad. It's a real downer. It's a real yeah. downer for the video game industry this weekend, unfortunately. Well, let's just get in right into it here, because there is a lot to, to cover. Um, so the first story we have here is about the Bayonetta voice acting controversy. Oh, boy. This was really something. Uh, um, rough weekend for yeah. Platinum Games and Nintendo and... Whatever poor sap is uh, doing Running PR for boards. Bayonetta 3. Yeah. Uh, maybe not Oof. the most fun weekend, but okay, let's just go over the high points of this. Yeah. So the original Bayonetta voice actor, Helena Taylor, posted a video on Saturday morning saying she was offered $4,000, 4000 mm. US dollars. USD, yes. Uh, to voice Bayonetta in Bayonetta 3. Right. Uh, she said, no, thank you. Um, and she also asked fans to boycott the game. Right, right. Uh, she said a lot. She posted four different videos, and she had quite yeah. a bit to say, but um, that's the, the key stuff there. Um, so Jennifer Hale is actually going to be Bayonetta in the game, and people were wondering, you know, well, what, what's how does she feel about all this? She put out a tweet, actually, just moments before we recorded this, saying that she is under NDA, uh, so she can't say a lot, but she supports the rights of actors to be paid for their work. So mm -hmm. hard to tell... You know, what, what that means. Right. Um, also over the weekend, um, Hideki Kamiya had a Twitter meltdown and deleted yeah. his account, uh, which has since uh, reappeared. He seems to be starting from scratch. He had like zero followers. For, I don't know. I mean, I've never oh, deleted boy. my Twitter in a fit of rage. In so a I don't, fit of rage, yeah. I don't know how it works. I do know yeah, you I can. Mean, he's... 
you can talk to Twitter and they can help you if this sort of thing happens. But maybe he's I mean, just you're somebody then, on tilt. Sure. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. And he's definitely, you know, sort of notorious for being um, a certain type of way on Twitter. Right. So so he having this kind of reaction is, is sort of, <laughs> I guess, like on brand for him. Um, but certainly not a great weekend for him. I'm sure, I'm sure he's feeling a lot and he's probably getting a lot of terrible comments from people. Right, so. right. Yeah. Um, where, where do you even want to begin with this? There's so many angles that you can approach this from. Yeah. Well, let's begin with the fact that I'm just going to say it out loud so people know. Like, I really do not have a lot of expertise or understanding of, like, how the voice acting, like, industry works. When we were at Nintendo, they worked with a very specific company that does, that sort of hired their voice actors. We've had various degrees of interaction with voice actors, whether it's from a, a, you know, they want to do interviews or, or we want to put them into some sort of like marketing tactic. Um, but we, I, and I don't, I think maybe you too, like we don't, we really don't have a lot of expertise in the, in the industry of voice actors, how much they're supposed to be paid. Like what is all that? Um, what does that look like behind the scenes? So that, that's one like, foundational thing that I want to say. Um, but but the other thing that just struck me about this whole situation is that like, there's definitely two sides to the story. Um, you know, we obviously heard um, Helena Taylor's side. Um, and I, I think it's, it's super like brave of her to just like go out and put it all out there like that. But there's definitely a side from Platinum and from Nintendo that we're probably never going to hear about, which is what you were saying over the weekend. Yeah, we'll, so, we'll never know because even if they yeah. do say anything, it's going to be as vague as possible. We know how and these statements super are made. PR watered down. Yeah. They just yeah. need to move the conversation along because this game is coming out in under two weeks. They need people right. to focus on that. The, the timing for this is also really tough for them. Terrible. From yeah. that perspective. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, maybe we can look at the different scenarios of maybe what happened. So sure. what, what are the reasons why, why would she have been offered $4,000 to do this voice? I kind of um, feel like one reason is that they just don't want her to voice this character anymore and they want to move to a different voice actor. So they were trying to like, lowball her so she would not take the job I, I agree that this is a scenario isn't there an easier way though of just exactly. saying like we're moving in another direction thanks for your work um, exactly I mean this seems like the absolute worst way to do it to just be tight-lipped and be like we're just we're just not going to pay you that stinks yeah that's a and, and that's and that's unprofessional way. And very um, if, if this was the reason that would be a very unprofessional and frankly a like just a, a, a bad human move. Like, right. don't treat people like that. That's just uncalled for. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. be transparent as a company. If you want to be creatively different and do something else with a different voice actress, fine. Just be transparent about it, you yeah. know? Um, but um, that, that could be one scenario. So which, there's one in, scenario. In which case, that's, that would be terrible. The other scenario is, like, they, they literally, like, ran out of money on this project. And I saw mm -hmm. people saying, like, oh, well, Nintendo's backing this. They can just fund it. It's like... Every game has a budget and right. there's probably some wiggle room in every budget, but there, you reach a point where you aren't getting any more money, no matter what it is. Exactly. And this game has been in development for what, like, like five years. It's, it's crazy it's long. It's been a long time. So you could see a scenario where they just like spent their money on other stuff and were like, this is all we got. Um, in which case that's bad planning on their part because the voice is right. such a front and center part of the character and the game. Yeah. So I, again, it, all of these seem like it's like ridiculous scenarios of like, how could this have happened? But one of them did. Yeah, exactly. And, and again, the other thing that we've said, even like before this happened is that like, there does seem to be some like financial shakiness. Oh my gosh. In, 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 in the, yeah. the, company of platinum games right. like they make these like super just like over the top you know these games they take a long time to develop um i mean obviously you don't know the inner workings of this company but it just doesn't feel like it's financially stable no they've been taking on more and more licensed games which are just you know yeah. they kind I of mean, a sign yeah they don't have the platinum quality it's just like a paycheck 
Exactly. Um, they had that awful live service game that was a complete failure for Square Enix. They canceled that Scalebound game. They canceled that game. Um, they came out and said recently, you know, like our future is with Nintendo. We want to do more projects with them. Which let me translate for that you for that for you means please buy us. Please buy us. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, please save us from this and maybe from ourselves. Yeah. Um, there have just been a lot of breadcrumbs for a long time indicating like this company is on shaky waters um, mm -hmm. financially. Yeah. So if that was the scenario, though, you know, you, you did some digging and found out that Jennifer Hale, you know, is part of a union where there yeah. are kind of set standard rate rates. rates for mm -hmm. what someone don't should know earn. what those rates are. Though. But people do seem to feel like Jennifer Hale actually could be more expensive in the end. That's right. And, and that's what people are saying. Like Jennifer Hale is a very well-known voice act actor. Right. And is part of a, a union. Um, I'm shocked that maybe I'm not shocked, but it's, it's always like revealing to me when things like this aren't standardized. It's like, how, how's that possible <laughs> in this industry? But okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, if, if it's, if it's purely a financial thing, like it, it feels odd that they would go with Jennifer Hale and not some like fresh, fresh out of, yeah. you know, acting school. So, like, so I, I agree that that is odd. I do have sort of a 2A scenario, which is built oh. off of the last one. So they realize they're out of money. They offer Helena Taylor $4,000. She says, absolutely not. At which point they're really in dire straits. And that's when they go to Nintendo and say, we need some help. And oh. obviously Nintendo has this great network of voice actors. It was, always, it was always unclear how involved Nintendo was in these projects, but I always got the right. sense they were pretty hands off. And it was like, you guys are going to do your thing. You know, we're here if you need us. So I think they came hat in hand to Nintendo's door and said, uh, we're kind of screwed here. Um, you know, what what are our options? And, you know, the Nintendo localization team is top shelf, top notch. So I think they found a way to help her. They have obviously a relationship with Jennifer Hale. Who knows how the financial side of that worked out? Maybe they, you know, tipped a little bit into the bucket for that. But yeah. I could see, again, I don't know. I could see a scenario where that happened. The bailout. Like the bailout, you, when yes. When you go to your mom because yes. you need money. Daddy, help. <laughs> yeah, I got into a terrible <laughs> right. car accident. I've I, yeah. I've, I have, you know, destroyed this yacht and I need money. Yeah, in this case, like Platinum it's Games. embarrassing, man. Platinum Games is like the seventh year senior at the community college. Totally. And Nintendo's like, you know, Daddy Warbucks, who's just yeah. like... <laughs> This is like taking an <laughs> L, man. This is bad. This is embarrassing. Okay. Like if that happened, oh my Lord. Can you imagine like having to write that email or like yeah. schedule that meeting and be right, able to right. ask? Like, ouch. Um, in either, I think in either case, all of these scenarios, one of these scenarios happened, obviously. They all seem really bad. <laughs> and it's just not a good look for, for Platinum, for you know, Nintendo. By association, like, Nintendo, yeah. By, so, and Nintendo, I can see, is like literally just like trying to stay as far away yeah. as possible from this. I, you know, they were pretty hot and heavy with their Bayonetta tweets um, and like all the... all the. Uh, <laughs> we know the person making the <laughs> Bayonetta tweets. The person, and he is an He is angel. a genius. He is a, an angel and a genius. Yes. And uh, we love him. Uh, um, I hope he's okay today. Uh, but... <laughs> but um, but it's like, I, I can see them just staying real quiet on this, you know, and trying to distance themselves, which is what they do best. It's like, don't get involved. God forbid. Um, but yeah, that is that is real tough, tough look. Um, yeah. Two it, weeks before the game. And it's hard when, again, you know, they want to downplay this. They want it to just go away. But in the middle of the weekend, before you can get your story straight, you've got Kamiya just doing, you know, stream of consciousness, sure. Twitter meltdown stuff. Like that yeah. doesn't help. And he's saying things. It's like, I can just, we've all, you know, you and I have been there in these moments. Oh yeah. The, like these are some of the hardest moments to get control of. It is. And you just feel like it's spiraling and, and the pressure of Fix it now. needing to stem that right. bleed from the higher ups, the, the highest up. Like literally the president. <laughs> um, like seriously though, like this, they involve, like that team will involve like to the highest echelons yeah. of the company. When this kind of situation happens, like you better believe that the president is on call right now. Um, and it it is like 
the worst pressure to try to like stem that bleed. And it's like all these things you have two different voice actors, you have the, the producer, you have, you know, all of these outside things that are just going crazy and there's no way to control it. You yeah. know, the thing is trending on Twitter. In those like, situations, I always wanted to be like, let me remind you that I did not create this problem, exactly. but I will fix it for you. Yeah. Or like, so I, treat did me accordingly. Create, I did not create the internet. Okay. I am not, <laughs> you know, the, the, the founder of Twitter. I don't, I don't, I'm not on a fasting schedule, so I don't know like how, <laughs> Like, don't, yeah, don't be mad at me. Okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh yeah, my God. It's so yeah. funny. Um, yeah. um, all right. I'm turn- I'm putting the spotlight on you. Will you be boycotting Bayonetta 3? Look, I. What do you make of this? Yeah, the boycott thing is rough. It's rough. And I, I, I'm in the camp of there's a lot more people involved in making a game than, you know, just one person, right? Like the, the entire development team, five years. <laughs> Um, you know, worked really hard to make this, you know, probably incredible game. Um, so it feels harsh to like punish everybody because of this situation that maybe like those people, they, not maybe, definitely those people have probably no control over at all and didn't even know what was happening. They were like probably just busy like doing their own thing to make this game and like pouring their blood, sweat and tears into it. So it does feel bad to... um you know, to like punish them for that. I am also not like the the biggest Bayonetta fan though. So I can't imagine for like a huge Bayonetta fan, like, dang, that's rough. You know, that's, that's yeah. a hard, that's a hard thing to do. Um, but, you know, I, I've said this before with like Blizzard, you know, um, I, I, I will not be boycotting this game. I, I think that you shouldn't punish um, the entire development team for this, this, you know, this is a serious issue and it definitely needs to be looked at and addressed and people need to be paid fairly for the work that they do. But um, those people also worked. So I, I still want to support them and I, I, I still want to play this game. This, I'm sorry, but this game looks cool and I want to play it. So that's where I am. Um, I yeah. know it's tough. I know it's hard. I, I put this in the sort of search your soul and do what you feel is right situation right. where it's like, if you yeah. want to boycott it, boycott it. I won't be that's mad. Totally if you want to just buy it and play you. it and love it. Fine. If you want to buy it and make a donation to some, you know, organization that can help with, you know, sure. equal pay stuff. I think that's yeah. great too. Yeah. Um, I was looking closely again, our friend, um, JP Kellums. I was watching his Twitter closely over the weekend. Yeah. Cause he's actually like one of the few people who might actually have an insight into this. Cause he worked on, you know, the original, games voice work mm-hmm. with with oh, helena yeah. and he was just like i'm staying out of this <laughs> very smart of jp who is a very you know yes. a, a very nice man a nice guy and, and just uh, i i can tell i think he moved it he also put his twitter on private oh yeah i'm sure people were coming at him i know i i, um, I totally i am in i, I support him in yeah. this like you yeah. need to have some separation <laughs> right 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 for your own mental Not even health there anymore. It's like, yeah. yeah, like leave it for me. Gone for like five like, years at least. Yeah. I know, I know, but people are totally coming at him. Yeah, yeah. And and like the whole like, you know, we get that people are upset. Again, I, I'm all for awareness into issues like this and, and fair fair wage and all that stuff. I, I see how hard it was for Helena to make those videos. Like I can see it on her face when she's talking about this. Yeah. Stuff. Really like hard to watch her like go through it. But like I also don't think people should be sending like death threats to Kamiya, you know, like stuff like that. Like we're not yeah. making no, like when you react in that way, you really aren't making the situation better. Um, yeah. It, it's just, it causes this like whole swell of different reactions and emotions. And, and it's, I think it's, it's really like, it's really hard, you know? And, and uh, yeah, I agree. Like do what you think is best for yourself to feel good to look at yourself in the mirror and say like i'm i'm good with me today you know um but yeah it's really unfortunate um that this is all happening uh from one project in shambles to another uh g4 has shut down again uh this happened (laughs) sunday and uh there was Honestly. An email that was sent out from the chairman and CEO of Comcast. What is Comcast Spectator? I guess that's like that's the probably like their unit company. Their yeah. unit focused on like I don't know, like ner- nerdy stuff maybe. <laughs> um, Gaming. Stuff? And he said, 
Over the past several months, we worked hard to generate interest in G4, but viewership is low and the network has not achieved sustainable financial results. As a result, we have made the very difficult decision to discontinue G4's operations effective immediately. Ouch. Um, making it worse, it sounds like a lot of people did not know that this had happened until they saw people tweeting and sharing this email. Right. Um, class acts. Unbelievable. <laughs> but believable. On Sunday? On a On Sunday? Sunday night, you open, <laughs> again, Twitter is like RIP. Oh my um, God. Don't open Twitter on a Sunday or any day <laughs> if you don't want like to be in complete shambles over the weekend. But um, yeah, people, friends of ours, creators. Yeah. Really talented literally people. Literally wonderful talented creative you know very like people that have dedicated a lot of their you know time and resources and creativity to to this um to g4 like literally found out from a tweet that they don't have a job anymore i, I wow <laughs> like this is unreal like how can you possibly feel like how can you Go ahead with this as the person that is, you know, heading up this, heading up G four. Like, how do how do you how do you do that? Yeah. I don't understand. You certainly can't blame the talent because the talent no. they had was top notch and they were doing good work. It really is, like, you know, I go back to like people asking, like, 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 oh, you know, you know, what happens if Apple gets into games or when Google gets into games? It's like a lot of these big companies just seem to look at games as like a sure a thing, cash cow. free yeah. lunch. And they don't understand, you know, the work go that goes into it. You need to be right to have the right strategic approach. Yeah. You know, people who play games, you know, they want to be spoken to in a certain way. It just feels like they whiffed on that side of it. They totally did. And like, it's it's so clear that the sort of the, the, the shuttering of this is so much, maybe like 100% to do with the management of this company and the management of how they were distributing their content and, and what, in which ways they're, they were like strategically doing that and like 0% because of the actual content that they were making. Cause yeah, that stuff was like really well done. It was highly produced. It was like top talent. Like they, they really had like a team that understood that lived um, the, the, the content creation side that really lived in the gaming space. Um, but the way that they were like trying to get this stuff out to people was like so antiquated. Like I didn't, we never knew we were like watch this, you know what I mean? Like, how are you supposed to like find it? You know, if you are not understanding like where your audience is watching it, it's, uh, it's crazy. It is so crazy. Did you watch G4 when it was a thing? I did when it was like a really? thing back on cable. I used to watch G4. Believe it or not, I I, I really didn't. I was kind oh. of like, okay, this exists, but I, I it wasn't really into it. It reminded me of like it. gaming MTV, you know? Yeah, yeah. Where you would have like the Kurt Loader, like TRL kind of kind of situation where you're like counting down stuff. It's very much like that kind of vein. Yeah. Which totally translates to like an online streaming, like whatever presence. But I don't know. I'm not gonna, yeah, I can't like dissect this, yeah. but it's just the, the biggest thing for me was how sad I was for all of these like incredibly talented and, 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 um, amazing creators that did not deserve to find out that they basically had no more job because it was like from a tweet, like that is yeah. the next level, like worst company ever to work for kind of situation. The thing that's also a bummer is like these, these corporate overlords seem to never really learn their lesson. So I'm yeah. sure, you know, the CEO of Comcast spectator, either he's going to forget about this in a year or they're going to, there's going to be a new guy and he's gonna be like, yeah, let's, let's do this thing for gaming. And it'll just be a cycle. Exactly. It's so true. It's always like this. It's always like, they're so detached from the actual. Yeah. It's like one of a hundred projects that they have going. Yeah, so they, don't, they don't care. Yeah, they don't care. Yeah, right. but it's like actual people whose like lives are <laughs> changed and right. you know affected by something like this. Right. Um. Yeah. I, uh, it's so yeah, rough. It just stinks. It uh, it stinks so much. We need to move on to the to our questions. Please. That please. will. Uh, <laughs> that will be the Close palate cleanser this. we all need. We need a palate cleanser. Yes. We need a like yeah. Uh, as sure. always, every single question comes from our wonderful Patreon community. 
at that $2 a month tier. First, you can ask, or excuse me, level one, you can ask us a question. Uh, and our very first question comes from Shurikan. This one is directed squarely at you. Is there any okay. way either of you will play Sonic Frontiers? I am convinced is that Krista is an undercover Sonic hater, all caps, huh? since she's never tried oh. to consume anything Sonic related. Any reason why? I'm not a hater. Hate is the finger strong, is pointed right? at you. Very strong. Well, first of all, there is a, a very clear reason <laughs> both of us will play Sonic There's Frontiers an easy and, way to make it happen. Which is, we need to get to 50,000 subscribers on YouTube. So yes. tell your friends, tell your mom, tell your sister, tell your brother. Um, but uh, in, in, in terms of my own Sonic fandom, like, I have nothing against Sonic. I played some of the older Sonic games, like, kind of dabbled. I never had a... Like, I never had a Genesis or anything like that. So I obviously didn't own that console or anything. And of course, I grew up more so on the Nintendo side. Like, I, I did own, like, NES Super Nintendo. Um, so I was definitely, like, a Mario girl. But I never had anything against Sonic. Like, it never totally... It wasn't, like, something I was like, oh, my gosh, this game is amazing. I can't wait to keep playing it. Like, but I didn't dislike it. I thought it was fine. Um, but, yeah, I... I you know, if there was a choice, and I oftentimes had a choice, I would more so gravitate towards, like, Nintendo games. Um, so I think that's why. But I am very happy to check out Sonic Frontiers. Um, I even watched the Sonic movie recently on the plane. You said you really, liked it. I really liked it. It was really wow. good. I'm gonna, I want to watch the second one now. I haven't watched the second one yet. All right. Um, so, like, yeah, I, again... No hate. Um, I just didn't grow up like immersed in Sonic, you know? Um, so I don't have like the nostalgia like carrying me forward. Um, but I I'm open. I wanna I wanna wow. play this game. So help us get to fifty thousand subscribers because I do want to play this game. Sure cons really got you on your heels. There's a lot uh -huh. of backpedaling right there. What do you mean backpedaling? There's no I just heard what you said and it's like <sighs> you weren't ready for that, I think. I was so ready. Keep what it coming, sure uh, Simon has our next question. Uh -huh. Have you ever had to stop yourself from playing a game because it was affecting your mental health in any level? I had to give up and oh, literally no. give away Smash Ultimate because I was simply oh. not handling it well. The several changes the game made and the overall online experience made oh. me enter into a very serious love and hate addiction. <gasps> Nowadays, I will only play if someone invites me and actually has a copy of the game as I've refrained from even buying it digital. This is a wow. fascinating question. This is a very good question because there is such a, this is so real to me because whenever I am very immersed in a game, like I can feel it like seeping into every aspect of my life. And I think about it all the time. So I totally understand what Simon is saying when a game like Smash was sort of, he had sort of this like love hate addiction. Like that is such a, such a, a, a thing that I can relate to. Um, I think, okay, there's a couple of examples. World of Warcraft. Mm. I, I truly had, I think I had needed to see like a therapist for, cause I was addicted. Like I, I'm not afraid to admit that I truly had an addiction so much so that I was canceling plans with friends. I would forget to do, I told, I told people like, I'll like, I told somebody once, this is horrible. Um, like I will come pick you up at 10 o'clock and I was playing world of Warcraft and I totally did not. I ghosted this person. It's horrible. I can't believe I did that. I was so ashamed. And like, I was, I was playing like 24 hours a day. Like I was literally not doing anything else. I was just sitting in my room, like playing world of Warcraft. I was so, I, I then I realized like this was basically taking over my life. And I, I basically stopped playing the game and sold my character because I was like, I cannot. Just like I cold this, Turkey, cold Turkey. I had, wow. to, I had to. Yeah. Um, so now I'm really wary of MMOs because I have this nature that I can get very like obsessed with something like that. Um, so I'm really careful about, about it. Cause I can see myself falling into that trap very easily. Yeah. Games that are made for you to play them forever. I put them into this worrying category. And ex my example for me was, um, the Diablo series where I love Diablo I look forward to playing Diablo 4 with you when it comes out. But when you finish all of the content in the game and it just becomes about, well, now I'm just getting the best loot and I'm and I'm rerunning the same bosses again and again. Specifically, Diablo 2 was the one where I was 
more into than Diablo three. And I reached a point where I was just like, what am I doing? Yeah. Like I can, you know, one shot anything in this game. I'm still trying to look for the best equipment though. I'm running this ridiculous cows level that is not even, you <laughs> know, cows. thematically in line with what Diablo is. Yeah. And it really makes you think of like, why do you play a game? Why do right. you like games in the first place? And I just had to step away and I was like, this is not why I do any of this. And I think like you, I was just kind of addicted to that loop and feeling yeah. good from getting the new equipment. So I'm always wary of games like that and I'm glad to play them. But once I finish kind of the main content, I'm pretty much done with them. And I, and I just don't want to do that whole thing where you're just endlessly cycling for new stuff. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. That is a real like reward, like serotonin hit to your brain that games like that, um, they just do it so well. It feels so good. You know, when you finally complete that armor set, oh man, like that is like an amazing like you feel so accomplished but you just like didn't do yeah. anything you but just then there, there's room. always some next there's always some next treadmill after that they're so and good at that the way that they careful. make those games is devious you need to be careful you yeah. need to watch out for that that is one of the reasons why yeah. I've, I've always been wary about mmos because oh, yeah. i know it's like you'll just be doing nothing else forever and i now don't want to do that yeah, now add special events so that it doesn't feel like you're running the same boss loop over and yeah, over again. Yeah. And people that you're talking to all right, the time. Right. Like you feel like you're giving up like all your friends. Like yeah. I made real friends on that playing World of Warcraft. I hope they're okay. But like <laughs> I literally had to stop talking to all of them. Like my wow. my guild, my uh raiding guild, like I had to see you later. Like I cause I was like I was like failing. I needed to like get back into like life, you know. Blizzard, you're Blizzard. ruining our lives. Stop. Oh no. <laughs> Blizzard, you did this to us. Uh, all right. Our next question is from Bruce Stash. Did Nintendo ever have any non-Nintendo handhelds or consoles in any of their facilities? Yes. Um, there was a room, a conference room in the Redmond mm -hmm. office um, that was kind of adjacent to the treehouse, uh, where they had every you know, every, cur console. every current gaming device console, you name it there. That yeah. was part of the Treehouse's job was to be knowledgeable about all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so they definitely had that available. Um, and, you know, there's there's a good chunk of, of people who worked at Nintendo who were into more than just Nintendo games. And you know, obviously they may not Us be... included. <laughs> yes, may not be bringing it into the office. Um, and they certainly weren't like, you know, front and center in the office. But yeah, for certain people, that was part of their job to know what was going on. Right, totally. Yeah. Courtney has the next question. What is one song from a game soundtrack that on the whole seems to be a fan favorite that you just don't vibe with? With music taste being entirely subjective, I always find it interesting to see which popular songs people dislike for whatever reason. Also, I don't like how it sounds. It's a totally an okay reason. Hmm. Do you have an answer already? I do. That you prepared? Do. Okay, go for it. Let me think um, it is... Uh, one winged angel from final fantasy seven which oh, really? i mean it's fine it's it's, oh, no. it's it's like cool thematically but in like i mean final fantasy's got some bops and i would not put this on any of my my bop lists <laughs> but people like people seem truly obsessed with this and i don't know is it just like the sephiroth vibe or what it's is it Sephiroth vibe yeah i mean it is a very like intricate you know complex song so maybe there's just something like wow video games are you know the appreciation of like yes video games can be high art too look at this this is stacking up there with any sort of like classical music but i don't know if that one just never clicked with me all right i really don't like the voice version of the smash ultimate theme song oh with the singer yeah okay i think adding lyrics made it sound real cheesy and, yeah, uh, the the symphonic version of it, the instrumental version of it, um, I think it's really good. Like it has like that big, like sort of dramatic orchestral kind of feeling to it, which makes makes it like work well with this like massive game with all these crazy characters in it. But with the voice, with the singing, especially that singer and the lyrics and stuff, it's like this is really like lame and cheesy. The lyrics <laughs> like, are a little gibberish. Good. It's a little like Google it's, Translate. It's a little lyrics. Google Translate, and yeah. it just yeah, and it. It makes it it makes it feel like super like yeah it, I I didn't yeah love that. I can it understand that takes away the dramatic flair you know yeah yeah uh, Etherim 
wants to know, hello, Kit and Krista, if you could choose one Pokemon to be your partner, like Pikachu for Ash, which one would it be? I would choose Yamper oh, because he's Yamper. such a good boy. So um, cute. Snorlax will be my choice. Okay. I want to sleep on him. So like a, I took, like a, I took like a partner. Total. I took partner here to be a little bit different from just any old Pokemon. So I'm, not, I'm actually not choosing Machamp for this. Okay, who are you choosing? I I really again, it's such a bummer that these these Pokemon are not super viable in the game. I do like the really big birds. So I'm like, <laughs> it's a Pidgey Pidgeot. Pidgeot? Could Pidgeot Pidgeotty? be like my best Pidgeot? friend? It's like a like Why? a seven foot like a bird. Giant bird. You're gonna ride it? Yeah, I could ride it and it's <laughs> it's just there and it's like it it's could just it could, there. It could defend me. It looks cool. We got the same hair. Um I don't know. Oh, I you think, have the same hair. I think hair. that could be neat. See, everybody's gonna be like, oh, it's gotta be a cat or a dog, because everybody like loves cats. Like, there's more animals than cats and dogs out there, right? Is Snorlax a cat or a dog? Like, aren't, aren't you you always talk like, oh, I'm gonna do falconing, like these people who have these crazy I falcons on their arms. I do Isn't that the same that. idea? Well, not a seven foot falcon. Now I just That's... don't need to wear that that weird leather strap on my arm. Well, do you wanna get clawed to death? Because no, I don't want to. I'm gonna to. be the one riding him. Oh, I see. That's how it you works. You can use it to send me a message. Like a, like a, a raven. <laughs> send it send by me a raven. raven. Send it by Pidgeot. <laughs> um, that's awesome, by the way. If you can send me a raven, like in real life. Holy moly. I would love that. But yeah, Snorlax. You can use it as a couch in the house. All right. That's a good pick. Uh, Flowey has the next question. Hello. I was wondering if you could give more insight and details into non-specific oh. action figure. It seemed like Nintendo was trying to turn it into a new mascot, but then it just disappeared. Thank you. Well, you have to admit your feelings about non-specific action. I hate right it. now. You uh, hated it. That's my. my you voiced a lot of hatred for it during yeah. when it was coming into existence. Now, this was part of the Robot Chicken. Year? Well, this was no. No, this was the mega like, leading 64? up. No, this was oh. leading up to the Wii U kind of announcement. There was like a whole series of these like fake sitcom type videos that were made interstitials. And this was kind of like very early, like Nintendo Direct, Nintendo doing like video stuff. Yeah. But it was one of those things where like, I did, I don't think Nintendo of America had a lot of input. It was just like made in Japan and handed to us. Right. So then make the, the Japan office making an American style sitcom without a lot of input was always strange. Right. Um, like maybe, maybe we could give you some tips on that. Um, and it just felt cheesy and terrible and this was just such a like hackneyed gag that everybody tried really hard to make it into something and yeah. thank thank goodness it didn't otherwise we could have this abomination in smash brothers <laughs> <laughs> i think it's a good lesson to to like know that what what like one person finds funny another person doesn't like humor yeah. is so like music humor is so subjective and yeah, totally this cultural like gap between what is funny to like the US culture and, and what's funny in Japan is like really, really different. And um, I think that really contributed to like why this never really took off. And it was kind of like, it, it was one of those like jokes that just had crickets, you know, it's just dumb. Yeah. <laughs> um, I didn't hate it as much as you did, but you really like. No, voice a not lot a of fan. Dis dislike for non-specific yeah. action figure. Uh, Bulio asks, did Mr. Miyamoto or Mr. Iwata ever see the It Prints Money meme? What was their reaction and how did other Nintendo employees feel about it? Uh, obviously, we referenced that meme in our thumbnail for our last episode. Yeah. Where they say, the Mario movie will be the next thing to print money. I love this meme. I do too. This, I love, is, like, this is a classic. When you look at the actual meme to their like mouths are moving. Which is yeah. the like, <laughs> As the money have, like, shoots it's, out. It's like, um, it looks like Wario to me yeah. like, for some reason. It's got a Wario <laughs> feel. Um, yeah, I think that they are, were very aware of all the memes going around. They're very plugged in. And of course, um, Mr. Iwata is like, was like super plugged into all He probably the thought it was hilarious. On. Yeah. And I, I would... Exactly. I would think that he thought this was hilarious. Yeah. And the reason why I think this is because then like there was an era where we like made a lot of like, we like made a lot of quote memes. Like we had that, that sort of like um, moment where like Reggie, Mr. Iwata, 
Mr. Miyamoto, the Triforce, so to right. speak, was like getting, getting out, out of the, the truck car. to E3. And yeah. I, Mr. Wada said to me that I took the picture. Mr. Wada was like, do you think this will become a meme? I'm like, I hope so. <laughs> like, so he's like wanting things to be memed um, in this era. So I feel like he would have loved, he, he would have loved this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mikey, Mikey is hashtag poopy chair, which, which is, is great. Uh, that's, that's nice. Uh, like on, that. on average, how long would you say you spend in a character creator? Oh. I, rem I remember my first time playing Elden Ring. I spent over an hour and a half customizing my first Tarnish character and a dozen or so characters. After that, took a little less time, about an hour each. I don't know what Oof. it is that enraptures me, but it happens to me with every game that features character creation. I cannot be the only one. Please make oh, me feel not. normal. <laughs> you are so normal, Mikey. He's a hashtag poopy chair. Um, I am a character creation screen. Like, I, I will spend so many hours in there. Like, it's kind of crazy. Like, the Disney Dreamlight Valley was like a good 45, 30, 45 minutes in the, in the creation screen. Um, yeah, for sure. Uh, Cyberpunk had a very interesting oh, yeah. character creation screen. If anyone has played All sorts that, of well, sliders. We will not say it here in this very yeah. family friendly show. But if you created a character in Cyberpunk, um, you know what we're talking about. It was hilarious. Uh, a lot of time in that screen. <laughs> the, the Elden Ring one is devious because not only are you choosing the look, you are like have to pick some stuff to commit to stats. I know what this and it's stats. like this game is so hard. I could completely like ruin my whole run right here before I, I even started my, playing. I ruined my life because I did not think this through. And I picked a, a class that was like not for me. And then I had to like change classes in the middle yeah, of my, that's, remember I had respect. I do. That's what makes that one like super stressful. The other one that I did not, I, I know better now. Monster Hunter has a pretty detailed oh, one, but like yeah. 10 minutes into the game, you're putting on a giant helmet. You never see the face again. So it's like, what, I, what, what I was know. I doing? Was that wasting my time. I need to know that underneath the face is hot. Like, I need to know. Whatever. <laughs> I need to know. Whatever. I need to know. Um, Whoa. My phone just fell down. Hold on. <laughs> oh, no. Ow. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> I just hit my head on my computer. You've got to calm oh, down gosh. over there. My I gosh. Need to, I need to calm down. Breathe. Um, a very interesting next question from Adam, the number nine door. The way Kit pronounced days of the week always sticks out to me. I've never oh heard gosh. anyone say it like Tuesday rather than stressing the day. Yes! So what the heck is happening? My question is, what words do you say differently than others or words do you think other people say wrong? Maru asking, mayhem. Asking about <laughs> accents is funny because where I'm from in Northern Ireland, we have such a weird one. And he has a link to a video if you want to learn more about a Northern Ireland accent. Oh, I love this. Uh, I have been... To both Ireland and Scotland. Mm -hmm. And I really expected Scotland to be the trickier one with accents. Ireland blew Scotland away with the unintelligible accents. I was so lost there. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, that was hard. Oh, no. Um, I've n Nobody's ever mentioned this to me. That's interesting. It's, it's I have been listening to you pronounce Tuesday for like 10 years and I was like why does he say it like that well what have you but been then, biting your tongue for but I'm ESL so I was like oh come on I'm saying it wrong no <laughs> people should know though like there is a way that we communicate that is like there are a lot of built-in like inside jokes that have just materialized over yeah, you know however many years this has been so people in the last episode were like oh why are they saying turnt? That's a that's a weird old outdated phrase. It's like because we knew somebody who said turnt like every other sentence <laughs> and it was hilarious. So now it just it just became part of our vocabulary. The vernacular. Another one you might hear us saying uh, the get word the gift going. Oh, the no, word the word egg. egg. In in the Flight of the Concords, which is a great show. They're from New Zealand. I guess in a New Zealand <laughs> accent you pronounce egg as eeg. Please so, tell us Angie if we're wrong already. Yeah, ninety nine percent of the time, if we say egg, we're going to pronounce gonna it be eeg. eeg, and only eeg. we're going to understand, and everybody else is going to think we're morons. Yeah, I know. There's a weird <laughs> Tuesday. Is I don't not have that. an explanation for that. Okay, that's just it's the just that's just me. Know. Take it or leave it. Um, say say crayon. Crayon. Okay, that's good. Somebody say some people say crayon. Oh, like water. Sounder. Water is a is a big regional one. Water. 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 There's a lot water? of different. Water. Water. Just across America, do there's we, a lot of do pronunciations you guys think of that. that. We have um, Californian accents because I went. To yeah, like Dilly. Like, can you tell us if it's like a 
a California accent? Uh, um, yes, I like do surf to work every day, though. So. But just tell to us if that... you think, because we do have an international <laughs> fan base. Yeah. The comment's going to be, please stop talking. Um, or mayhem. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> on to the oh shurikan is back shurikan had so many great questions we had to pull two from shurikan okay this may be a well, sensitive, sensitive sensitive topic but do you know what nintendo's overall thoughts on desmond amofa oh, or etika were yeah. since he was the self-proclaimed nintendo yeah. bad boy and also made the joy con part of his brand with joy con boys or joy con men also there was a lot of unfortunate controversy surrounding him in 2019 and since he had the elite Nintendo Switch before the Switch came out. Yeah, yeah. A lot of yeah. people ask us about the leaked Nintendo Switch. That was really not a thing at Nintendo. It really wasn't a thing. Like people, didn't, yeah. people somehow did not know about that. Um, yeah. But a lot of people were into... I think it's because there's a lot going on. Yeah. A lot of people were into Etika. And a lot of people were crushed uh, when he passed. So, so obviously sad. not something, you know... He was not entirely on brand, but he was inspirational for a lot of people, and his stuff totally. was one of a kind. So he had a pretty big and dedicated following within Nintendo. Totally, totally. I think a lot of us, like, we couldn't officially, from, like, a Nintendo, like, ambassador or whatever we used to call it, perspective, like, bring him into the program right. or whatever, because he was sort of, like, a Nintendo bad boy, self-proclaimed. Um, I think it's great. Uh, but his creativity and just his passion was like something that we all look to um, as a source of inspiration. And, and yeah, even like just right now, we're, we're talking about how we were inspired by Etika to do the yeah. heart rate monitor um, scary games thing. So right. we're still inspired by Etika's creativity. So yeah, it was so, so, so sad. Yeah. Um, but and my, yeah, and big fans my enduring um interaction w with etika will be him uh, making fun of me for doing a hover hand in a photo oh well to me yes I did. <laughs> your best friend you didn't have to do that it's okay <laughs> <laughs> the internet's a scary place though we don't want to get canceled <laughs> um our next is from again this person always includes a, a handy me, pronunciation guide let me try vidge michter yes yes um, who asks, we talk about food quite a bit in the Kit and Krista Discord, but it's sure almost do. always fancy restaurant food or homemade dishes. Do either of you have a guilty pleasure in terms oh. of fast food chains? We're getting down. Ooh, fast food chains. Popeyes, um, Popeyes. fried chicken. That I said it first. Get another one. <laughs> okay. Uh, Bojangles. Oh, you had that once. I love Bojangles. No, Come I on. have had it multiple times. Whatever. My cousin lives in Raleigh. <laughs> All right. Excuse me. So you. we both skew pretty fried chicken there. I like the fried chicken. <clears throat> yeah. 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 Oh yeah. I also like food truck food a lot. Oh. You and I recently had um, a local like food truck thing in San Francisco. Oh yeah. Senior Seasig. That was very good. That's kind of like fast food too. Like it's not. I think so. I think yeah. that counts. Yeah. And it was so good. <laughs> oh my right. gosh, it was amazing. Popeyes though. Whoo. Mm. Uh, jambalaya fries are really good. And that's all of our questions. So thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you so much. Great questions as always. And they always come from our wonderful Patreon subscribers. So if you want to ask a question, join us. Uh, maybe you can tell this episode's getting a little bit long and we're getting a little bit loopy. Um, but we have some important yes. things to do before we go. Yes. Superstar shout out. Yes. Here we go. I'm going to go first. All right. So I can say the name that you laugh at every time. Here we go. Aaron Hash. Ben Icorn. Maru Mayhem. Eigenverse. From Raul. With love. Jordan Collette. Kiss my flapjack. Mike Chin. Mr. Rogers. Paul Gale Network. Rain Tech. Roy Eschke. Simon Barrera. Switching it up. Underscore. Safazon. The Shark Among Men. VGM Life. Link, the hero of winds. Angela Bycroft and Molly, her pig. All Yay! right. Hooray. Thank you, thank you, superstars. We love you. Okay, and on to our one of club graduation ceremony. A. Ron Burgundy. Adam Edwards. A. John Malari. Ale Alejandro. Alexandra Pratt. Andre NYH. Astrodev. Bagel. Welcome, Dano. Bruce Stash. Chancellor Fairley. 
Christopher Lay. Cozy Tar. Captain Cinnamon Buns. Captain Alex. C Roper 17. Daniel Cold. Daniel Valencia. Doxon. Devin Does Stuff. Doodoo Face. Douglas Chomix. Dino Punch. Elite Peach. Etsparts 50. Ezrato. Furbound. Fred Rossi. Gar. Garrett Hullfish. Ian Shea. Israel or Izzy. Jay Rando. Jabroni Jones. Jackie Z. JK99. JBJ. Jeff Yoka. Jesse Hernandez. Jim Wakelin. John Responte. Jordan Hammerly. Joseph DeHayes. Joshua Clements. Juji Fruit. Just Camtro. Kai Comercio. Kawa2796. Kelp Shake. Kevin Delane. K Madman TV. Chris Dorati Kid. Christopia Party With Me. Kyle Gamer Barry Rookie. Kyle Kretzer. Kyle LaBeouf. Kyler Nelson. Linnell Stickman. Lego My Frago. Lit. Lucas Pico. Mad Dog 5981. Malfarink. Mamu. Marky Man 64. Matthew Rewald. Mecha Dragon 101. Megan. Michael Cravens. Mikey. Murph. Mytran. Nazar. Nathan Burkhart. Panda Buns. Piano Psychopath. Prince Charmless. P.S. Wee. Quinn. Oh, Quinn Hardigan. Reaver. Ray Chiron. Reed 031. Ryuji Utsuho Oku. Renee Rivers. R.J. Kern. Rob Osborne. Rocks. Ryan Hayes 521. Ryan Netta. Sam Neeland. Sharif Jackson. Sheer Cold Vanilla. Shinryu. Slowbro. Schmiggles. Silly Ferret. Spicy Munchkin. Seal Citron. Thomas Alvarez. Troopage. Tugs Puppy Bear. Tyler Geis. Video Game Stupid. Beautiful Dandy. Virtual Bot. Wicked Davy. Will Ernst. Will Johnson. Zutaverf. Zelgaroth. Zeroid. Whew. Those last three. Whew. It's like a ton to <laughs> it's like I'm almost at the end and I have Zutaverf, <laughs> Zelgaroth, and Zeroid. Oh no. <laughs> It's like Lord of the Rings things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Elven Lord Zelgaroth. <laughs> uh, anyways, um, oh my gosh. Three, what an episode. Like three hour podcast. We need to go. Don't forget to follow us on Patreon. It is patreon.com slash kittenkrista. Keep this going. We need you, literally, to keep this going. So please join us. Thank you. Thank you for everyone that is supporting us there. We can't make any of this content without you. Um, please don't forget to follow us on our social media channels. We are on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and of course, YouTube. And that's it. Like, subscribe. That is things. it. Yes. Yes. All right. Thank you again to Jeff Keeley for coming on the show. He's great. Yes. You're amazing. Jeff, we can't wait to see you in LA for the, the Game Awards in December. It's going to be great. Yeah. All right. We will see you guys later. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye.